downside is I now have like infinite windows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's okay. Sorry about that. That's life, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I'm just kind of used to it. Every, every, every time yeah. you, you start doing something with technology and you try to do something just a little bit differently than normal, things can get a little weird. Oh, I know. It's frustrating. Okay, so stream is now up. So I'll just turn on cardboard live. Okay, Cardboard Live is is active, so we're good to go. I'll kind of give people another minute or so to get in here, and then I'll just start cool. doing my thing. Sounds good. So you've you've had a pretty decent run with the uh, the deck already, right? What are you up to? Three or four or five O's? Uh, three five O's, sixty seven percent win percentage. Um, so yeah, pretty good. I think playing Loam for as long as I have helps. Like, I'm not just coming in being like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, so. I think conceptually the decks are somewhat similar. Like, uh, obviously there's there's huge differences in, like, play patterns and whatnot, but you're you're playing, like, non-blue control decks. And there's I mean, a decent think it amount is. of overlap. Hmm? I, think it's just, I, think, I think it's just that Legacy, more than any other format, your success is dependent on how much you know the format. So like having played all the main decks so many times, you kind of go in with any deck and be like, I know what my opponent's doing, and that helps you a lot. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the critical success of, of DNT is like you need to understand what your opponent is doing so you can really like dismantle it. Right. Yeah, so that's felt like it's helped a lot. And I have... Um... There's some matchups with D&T that just feel so much better than with Loam. I mean, obviously vice versa, too, but um, that's something I've really liked about the deck. I feel like I don't have to fight as hard against certain decks. And you sometimes get free wins with D&T. Like, if you have those, like, fast, vile, mom, Thalia port starts, you pretty much are winning most of your games. Yeah, and, and the same thing can be said for, like, you know, a turn one chalice start into something like a Bob or a Knight from Loam. That's that's true. That's true, I guess. Yeah. It just feels like, I don't know, I felt like my matchup against stuff like Miracles is easier, mainly because I just don't care about their enchantments, which has been so relaxing. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, not having to just like, oh, if I don't play around back to basics, I might lose the game on the spot. Yeah, that's, that's frustrating. Yeah. That and counterbalance, being like, I don't give a shit about your counterbalance. It's yeah, really that, nice. that thing on two is a beating. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go and do my intro. All right. Uh, good afternoon, folks. My name is Phil Gallagher. I run Craven University, a site for legacy death and taxes. And today I'm not going to be playing D&T. Rather, I'm going to be doing a tutoring session. Uh, so I'm here with Connor Fulz, who you might remember from uh, the, the Four Color Loam guest stream I did a while back. Uh, he's Loamer Boy from the chat. He's recently picked up D&T as a second deck, and he's looking for a little bit of help. So hi, Connor. How are you today? Good, Phil. How are you doing? Thanks for having me back on. Hi, chat. Um, I know you, most of chat probably knows me as I'm around, and I started my own stream and guested on your stream before with Loam. I, I picked up D&T a couple weeks ago, and I love it, and I just thought I'd like, it might help just to talk with you through some of the matchups, because I'm, I'm not nearly as experienced as I am with D&T as with Loam, so... Yeah, so, so Con Connor knows Legacy. He, he knows his stuff, and he's just kind of looking for a little push in terms of sideboarding, because like starting to sideboard with D&T can be a little bit daunting, because a lot of your cards are fine, and so some of the nuances of sideboarding can be a, a little bit tricky. 
so today's yeah. stream is going to be a little different than normal. So normally I'm, I'm playing through matches and I'm interacting with chat a lot, but today's stream is going to be more me interacting with Connor. I have sort of his sideboard guide and his deck list up on screen. So kind of what I'm going to do is we're probably going to go through 20 or so legacy matchups and just kind of briefly talk about the matchup approach and sort of how we should be sideboarding. So you'll notice that my camera and his camera are not on the screen today. That is intentional to give sort of the maximum amount of on-screen space. And that's because I'm going to drag a lot of cards around for this because I think it's very helpful to do all of this stuff visually. Uh, so chat, for those of you that are here, hello, and I thank you for joining in, uh, especially Lasco. Thank you very much for, for resubbing. Yeah, the, the months really fly by. I'm actually coming up on a year of streaming now. Uh, believe it or not, uh, which is crazy. That's pretty nuts. Um, so on my secondary screen, I'm going to have his sideboard guide up. So I'm going to check in on the chat from time to time, but if it takes me a little while to get to a message, uh, please don't be offended today. Uh, this is also sort of uh, an advertisement stream. I do do tutoring on a regular basis for D&T. Um, my normal rate, um, I, d I decided to drop it a little bit, you know, it's the holidays and everything. So normally I do it for, for $30 an hour. I've, I've dropped down to $25 an hour. Connor is getting this one for free. Uh, he, he's helped me out a lot with Four Color Loam, and I really appreciate that. Uh, so this stream will probably run somewhere between one and two hours. You know, I don't necessarily have a cutoff time or anything, but that's about what I'm expecting. Yeah, and I think at least it'll be maybe helpful if newer players end up seeing this just to talk about D&T and picking up, you know, just generally how to sideboard and things. So that's a benefit. I'm sure a lot of your followers already play the deck or know a lot about the deck, but maybe some don't. Oh, yeah. I The the channel started out almost entirely as Legacy D&T, and now it's kind of a mix of mostly non-blue controlling-ish decks. Um, but sometimes I'll go a couple of weeks without playing D&T, so some, some good old D&T content is, is always appreciated. Yeah, and you know what it is, Phil? I also really just love talking about Legacy and this format, and I like learning new decks, and I've kind of decided recently that I am no longer playing other formats, and this is my <laughs> Congratulations! That was a big step for me yeah. as well. Yeah, so um, I think that's like... It's just fun to be like, all right, I found a new deck. I want to learn it. I'm um, excited about it. And, you know, because that was the fun part about Loam is like really diving deep into that deck and learning it and playing it for 700 matches. And like, you know, I wanted to do that with something else. I just think the format, I mean, we don't have to get into this because it's not what the stream's about, but I just think Legacy on the whole is uh, so much more intricate and interesting and fun than the other formats in Magic. And I don't mean that in the latest view. I think. Everybody should enjoy whatever format they want. And I understand Legacy is very hard to get into because of the price. But I really think it's like the way Magic is meant to be played as far as like the complex interactions and interesting matches and wide open format. Um, and even right now, after the banning, it seems like there's a lot of room to brew. Every week I look at the 5-0 list and there's always some crazy list someone came up with at 5 O's, And I think that's great. Like, I don't know if you saw this past week, there was a list running, like, two Brea, and it was just this random four-color, like, Pyromancer, Lingering Souls, Brea list, and I was like, that's sick. Yeah. So that's I, what's so great about the format. I, I could go off on a long tangent here, but, like, I'll just say this. Since the banning of Probe and Deathrite Shaman, there has only been one deck where I felt like I didn't have a chance to 5-0 when I sat down and played it with, and that was that rough Enchantress deck that I played that was just clearly untested. <laughs> Other with the than cartouches, that one, yeah, yeah great. with the cartouches. Other than that stream, <laughs> I felt like I had a fighting chance in like every league that I sat down to play, and that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's what's so fun about it, and it it feels like you're playing. You know, I went to GP Portland to play Modern. I didn't feel like I was playing Magic. I felt like I sat down and I rolled the dice, and that was about it. And I hope to draw better, and I hope I had cards that you know mattered. And in Legacy, you just feel like your decisions matter, your hands matter, you're not just dead on turn one if you don't have certain cards. Um, I mean, of course, sometimes you just get, like, char belchered on turn zero or whatever, but yeah, sure. you always feel like you have ways to combat every strategy. And 
uh, I just don't see a point to play other formats anymore, um, really. All right, um, so why don't we go ahead and get into it um, yeah. to just answer one chat question before I go. Lasco, sure. I think something like that is a great idea. Um, probably sometime in January, I'll just sort of do a one-year reflection on streaming piece, and if I'm going to do something like that, I'll, I'll announce it in there. All right, so Connor, your, your sideboarding notes here start with Grixis Delver. Uh, yeah, well, I wanted to first go over my list a little bit. I've had some good success with this. I started playing only a couple weeks ago, but I've got three five O's with this list pretty much, and then I've also got a pretty good win percentage, around 70%. I've played almost 100 matches with the deck so far. I think the list feels really good. Obviously, unlike Loam, I think D&T is ever-changing based on the meta, and you can always like swap in and out sideboard cards depending on what you want to beat. Um, which is a little frustrating to me because sometimes I like my decks to be locked in, but <laughs> yeah, and like I'm trying to to just go with it. The most frustrating thing about D and T when you're a newer D and T player is you change one or two cards in your deck list, and then sometimes it's like, oh god, this changed my entire sideboard plan. Like, yeah, now I don't want to board those cards out plan. anymore. Right, um, but I think with this list, I feel really good about it as far as like a list to combat a wider meta. Um, yeah, so I know there's probably some things that you disagree with, like the two Sarah Avenger or the Cavern of Souls, or uh, maybe some of the sideboard choices, or even like not playing a Hollowed Spirit Keeper. But uh, I've been really happy with everything. I don't feel like there's anything I'm just like, wow, that card's been bad, or wow, I don't think it's been useful. Yeah, so, so. like in looking at the, the main deck here, like my first thought is this is a very safe, aggressive DNT list. Like, you've got two yeah. Baron Crusaders, two Sarah Avengers to help close out the game. You've got a decent amount of aggression, and then you've got a couple of great Silver Bullets and Palace Jailer and Sanctum Prelate. Um, right. The Cavern of Souls gets worse as you play more non-human threats, and I've also liked yeah, I've 24 lands over 23. Yeah, I know that some people, that's kind of a point of contention. Like, the other day I got... Uh, screwed out against UB Shadow and lost both games because I kept a two lander and never drew another land, and then I kept a one lander on six and never drew another land. So that'll happen sometimes, but for the most part, I felt like 23 has been fine. Cavern is one of those lands where I'm curious to hear your opinion on it because I think sometimes it just like wins games on its own, and sometimes it's like a huge headache. So yeah, so. Cavern of Souls is what I consider to be a medium risk, low reward card in that more often than not, you're going to run into things that punish you for it than things that reward you for it. However, in the small percentage of times where you get the cavern in the matchup where it matters, it is very good. Yeah, so that's what I'm, I noticed. I'm more worried about like opposing Wasteland, Back to Basics, um, Blood Moons, and things like that than I am the upside of like, oh man, my opponent had Counterbalance, and now I have this Cavern of Souls. And well, as you can awesome. see, I have decided to play it over the third Caracas, so I'm still keeping the planes count the same. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I don't miss the third Caracas. I think I, I I've been on two since the summer. So yeah, yeah. I, I think like two's been fine. You get a lot of awkward hands with two Caracas in it, and it's just terrible. Um, and you often have enough game, from what I've noticed, against decks like Reanimator, um, that you don't necessarily need the Caracas to win. I mean, and I don't think it helps that much against Sneak. Like I've said with players. Yeah, they just long. try to omniscience you, and it's only yeah. it only buys time versus sneak attack. It doesn't actually beat it. Yeah, I have a lot of very uh, strong opinions on that matchup because a lot of the decks I play in Legacy, the decks I enjoy playing, are bad against sneak inherently, and I just I think it's a matchup that I'm okay with kind of like giving up points to because of omniscience. I mean, you can have all these sideboard cards that help against sneak attack and show and tell and. You can win matchups. People always ask me in the Loam Discord and Facebook, like, what can you do against Sneak? Or can I play, like, three Containment Freaks? And I'm like, it still doesn't beat Omniscience. So yeah. it just you kind of have to accept that that's going to happen sometimes. And I'm fine with that. I've accepted that that's just, like, not the best matchup. All right, I'm going to answer a chat question. Uh, does yeah. Lomer Boy have a Twitch handle as well? Yes, the, the Twitch handle is Lomer Boy. 
Uh, that is my Twitch. You can go to my page, and I would love people to follow if they want to. And uh, I do plan on streaming again soon. It's been a while, but I'm figuring some things out, so I should get that up and running this month. Great. Um, and just to talk about the sideboard, this is pretty pretty stock. Like you've got to make a decision about which four mana card you want to play. Cataclysm yep. hits hardest versus Grixis and Miracles, which are popular right now, so it it makes sense. Yeah, I think the MVP of the entire deck for me has been Cataclysm. That card by itself wins games. You have no business winning. It's ridiculous against Grixis and Miracles. Almost, there are course times I cast it where my opponent just makes six straight land drops and you still lose. But if you time it correctly, uh, you literally just win the game almost every time. It's also very good against lands, very good against Eldrazi posts. Like, it's so good. I don't, I wish I could play it in Loam. It's my favorite card in the deck. I probably would never play less than two as long as Miracles is a deck, as long as Grixis is a deck. All right. Um, why don't we start running through some matchups then? Uh, unless you have any other yeah, like questions. Yeah. No, that would be that would be helpful. I think I just want to make sure I guess that I'm like kind of on the right track against all these matchups, and I'm not like making huge uh, sideboarding errors that are hurting me, or you know, because I think I'm like with Rome, I've played it long enough to be really confident with my plan in every matchup, and here I'm kind of like guessing on some of them. So, all right, so. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag these into two columns. The column that I'm going to have here is going to be your out column, and the column that I have here is going to be the in column. I'll kind of like drag what you have to the appropriate spots, and then we'll go and sort of talk about is there anything else we would want to change. So yeah. ma matchup one here is just Grixis Delver. So this is sort of your, your stock configuration. You wanted to pull these cards and add these, which yep. seems to make quite a bit of sense to me. The, the Palace Jailer is something that can be good against some of their draws and abysmal against others. Yeah, I, I've been putting it in on the draw and taking out a Mom. I don't know if that's right, but Mom just seems worse on the draw. Jailer seems better. So, one thing I'll say about this matchup is there's one other card that I don't love in the main deck, and that's actually Sanctum yeah. Prelate. Okay. So, Interesting. this is a card that can be very powerful, but it also shuts off your best cards in the matchup. Like, the, the way you kind yeah, of lose... Yeah, just putting on one. Yeah. The way you lose this matchup is them getting a threat early that you can't really deal with and you just get clocked because you like yeah. you're, you're the control deck you have the inevitability so here's the problem like let's say they play a turn one and or turn two threat if this comes down on turn three this is too late yeah let's say your opponent has something on on board that you need to answer you don't have an answer right now and you play this and then you draw one of these swords to plowshares or path to exiles your best cards are are out so while this right. can be a game-ending card, I don't actually really like this card all that much in this matchup. So would you board that out over Jailer, just in general? Um, I, I probably would do that, yeah. So I, okay. I'd be more inclined to cut this than Jailer, although like Jailer going out is fine too. It, it is like a, a, an expensive card. And yeah, my issue with Jailer in the matchup just seems to be that it's really bad against True Name, so... And, and Young Pyromancer as well. Yeah. But, I mean, it does have utility in those matchups where you, like, your opponent lands a Grixis, or your, land, your opponent lands a Delver early, and then, like, an Angler. It's pretty good against Angler, so... Yeah. Kind of depends. So, there, there's not necessarily a hard answer here. So, these are the six cards that I would consider boarding out, like, like play versus draw. And yeah. you don't really have a sixth card that you want to bring in. Like, unless your opponent is playing something no. like Grim Lava Mancers that, like, is supplemental graveyard stuff, you don't want to be bringing in something like Rest in Peace. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't, and I don't think you want to bring in Chalice. Coming from, like, the Loam side of it, I don't think Chalice is very good against Chalice Christ is the Stover. same problem with Sanctum Prelate, right? Except it's actually yeah, even worse too, yeah. because it hits your moms and vials. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I would 
probably just bored like that and bored out probably um, potentially this jailer. I mean, I guess you could just kind of see how they. This play, might be but... a play draw thing. Um, I actually think yeah. jailer is better when you're on the play because okay. when you're on the play, there's some chance that they board out dazes or trim dazes, and like you have the ch a better chance of getting ahead and then slamming this to sort of break parity and stay ahead forever. Yeah. Right. So, and I've noticed too. One of the things I've like really been enjoying playing D and T is that like your Delver matchups are just insanely good to begin with. Um, uh, that, I win rate that against is, that is correct. Three. You're very yeah. favored. So that's been great. <laughs> just like, like especially blue red Delver. I'm six and one against blue red Delver, whereas I'm like two and five against it with Loam. So, it's really nice to just be have like a good matchup there. Like they just seem to can't seem to not be able to deal with Stoneforge ever. So. Yeah. Um, so in this matchup, I definitely would not trim a mom. Like, okay. the, the biggest way that you win this matchup is just getting something into play that they can't beat. And a lot right. of times it's a creature plus a piece of equipment. So if you have mom yep. to protect a critical threat like, you know, say Thalia or Mirren Crusader, a lot of times you're just taking over the game or forcing them yeah. to have a, a sideboard card like Dread of Night or Forked Bolt to take this off the board and, like really play a regular game. And this is one of those matchups where I think that Sarah Avenger is excellent. Oh, Sarah and Avenger, Avenger is just insane. Like, it, it clocks over the, the young pyromancers. Like, it it walls them and the tokens. It trades with a Delver. Or, like, forces them into an awkward game where they're like, am I really attacking in with this Delver? Are they going to block? Right. Yeah, it's been great, um, just in general, but also one of the things I've loved about it is it plays really nicely around cards like Dread of Night and Marsh Casualties, so it's one of those like main deck cards that can play around your opponent's hate. Yes. Um, and I've liked that a lot about it as well. So. Yeah, so to kind of give you my, my final thoughts here, I'd say when I'm on the play, I'd probably keep the Jailer in the deck. When I'm on the draw, I'd probably pull the Jailer and then keep one... Like, maybe keep a Recruiter of the Guard in if, like, you just want another effective copy of, of Stoneforge Mystic. Like, Recruiter is not great in this matchup. It's kind of slow. Um, yeah. But it's not like it's abysmal to be playing one. Okay. I, I think that's what I'd do. Um, that being said, you, like... Every matchup is kind of like, if they're playing certain cards, you you have a little wiggle room in what you want to do. So if instead they're, you know, they're playing a lot of extra graveyard-based synergy and you see things like Dark Blast, then you can, like, board and rest in peace over this or something. Right, yeah. Yeah, and I don't think there's any reason to have the sideboard too heavily uh, geared towards stuff to bring in for Delver, because you're already so good against it. No, and honestly, there's a lot of times where, like, in my sideboard, I only have four cards for Delver, and I just, like, board in these four cards, and that's it. Right, yeah, it doesn't seem like you need a lot. I, I feel like you're already pre-boarded with Stoneforges, so. All right, uh, so next matchup down the line is Rug Delver, so we'll probably board pretty similarly. Yeah, I, I was taking out a Crusader, but I think, given that's... what you just said, it's probably better to take out Jailer and Prelate. For the rest in peace, I think Rip is playable here because of Mongoose. So, so actually, Mirren Crusader is potentially one of your best cards versus Rug Delver because it's something okay. that can stall Tarmogoyf or attack through Tarmogoyf. Or same thing for Noble right. Mongoose. I was thinking on the like Lightning Bolt axis where it's pretty terrible there, but yeah. So maybe like... what you need to consider is how many things in this deck need to be Lightning Bolted. Mom. True. Stoneforge. Thalia, Crusader, yeah. and even just like some of the flyers that would trade with a Delver, like their lightning bolts are really taxed. They can't just save them for Crusader. All right, so you yeah, were that's true. you were doing negative two Revoker, negative two Recruiter, negative one Jailer, negative one Crusader, and yeah. then you were adding two Path, two Council's Judgment, one Rip, one Ballista. So this was your plan. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I want to ask you a question. What is Walking Ballista for? Um, well, <laughs> it seemed better than the alternatives. Okay. 
I mean, I, I just felt like it's a way to deal direct damage. It can kill a Delver if it's not flipped yet. I mean, it's obviously not very good because they're not playing Young Pyromancer, but uh, I guess I'd rather, like, after hearing what you said about Grixis Delver, I, is Ballista better than Jailer or Prelate? I don't know. Maybe not. So I think the issue with, like, walking Ballista in a matchup like Rug Delver is that it doesn't line up well versus the threats. So it can't kill Nimble yeah. Mongoose. It can't kill True Name yeah. Nemesis. It probably can't kill um, the Delve green creature. Uh, the, the apes. M uh, mandrels, yeah. Yeah, Hooting Mongoose. Mandrels. There we go. Yeah. So this can be a two-mana kill a Delver, but I think a lot of times it might be a four-mana kill a Delver or yeah. four-mana grow a Tarmogoyf. I, I don't think this is necessarily where you want to be. I think this would probably okay. be an example of overboarding, where you don't okay. necessarily want this. Yeah, so would you say that maybe you want to keep Jailer in against Rogue Delver because of Goyf? Um, I think Jailer is very high risk versus Rogue Delver. I think you're super favored against that deck, and so you just want to not accidentally lose the game. Yeah, and I think letting them draw a whole bunch of cards, uh, if they get the crown, is potentially bad. Jailer also doesn't necessarily yeah. remove a lot of their threats, right? So if they're playing like Nimble Mongoose and True Names, this doesn't actually hit that. Okay. So I'd actually be more inclined to trim this. Your your one mana removal spells are a little bit worse in this matchup than against other Delver variants. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you 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 still have to play them, right? Um, this card is extremely so, powerful versus Rug Delver because they are very very heavy on the ones, so it can still be a lights out card. Yeah. So you kind you kind of have to decide what you want to do. Like all all the rest of this stuff is is fine. You have five cards you want to bring in, you have six cards you want to board out, and you just kind of have to make a choice. Like, do you want a little bit of redundancy? Do you want, you know, something that can answer the non-protected threats? Or do you want something that can be a lights-out card? Okay. And, like, keeping any one of these in is, is probably fine. Again, I would not play Jailer on the draw for sure. Okay. Fair enough. Makes sense. All right. So what's next? Blue red. Uh, actually, I'm not even going to sort this. We're probably going to do about the same thing. Yeah. So I guess the difference in this matchup is that I've been. Um, I would still board in Ballista, and I would board in Chalice on the play. Um, hmm. Don't know. Don't know if you like the Chalice or not, because I think Crusader's worse here because they have even more. Crusader red definitely removal. is not good. All right, sorry. Let me yeah. let me take a second and just like see see what you're you're doing for sideboarding. So yeah. you were going Path, Council Judgment, Ballista, and Chalice. So this is your your seven for seven split. Yeah, on the play at least. Okay. I don't like Chalice on the draw, but so. I think, again, that many of your one-drops are probably some of your best cards in the matchup, right? So the games you yeah. lose against Blue-Red Delver are kind of the draws where they go, like, creature-creature, burn you a couple of times. And, yeah. you know, Swords of Plowshares and Path to Exiles are your outs to those draws. So I'm not overly keen on Chalice. Okay. Walking Ballista is also kind of medium, because a lot of their threats have two toughness at one mana or two mana. So this is essentially also just good against Delver. Well, they play Pyromancer, right? Or do they not now? Uh, Some builds do. Mo mo In my experience, more of the blue-red Delver decks are on, like, um, Delver, Goblin Guide... Monastery Swift Spear, and then the blue red flying prowess creature, uh, Storm Chaser. Storm Chaser, yeah. 
So if if that's the the removal package, then again, walking ballista is kind of weak. Right. So this is actually probably a matchup where I probably only board like four cards. Yeah. So you're actually leaving the jailer in, or maybe you leave one revoker in because of lava mancer. Yeah. So. Grim Lava Mancers out of the sideboard are pretty common, but if they don't have that, then they have, like, literal nothing. So, right. the the issue is, like, Revoker's pretty terrible, Crusader's pretty terrible, Jailer's very slow, but insane if it sticks, and Recruiter is very slow as well. So this, yeah. is, this is kind of a case where you have seven cards that are pretty bad and four cards that are pretty good. Right. So... This is probably a time where I, I'd keep this guy in the deck. Um, okay. The difference being that they have so much more direct damage that can just go to your face to close out the game. That sometimes, you know, this plus a piece of equipment locks up the game. And this is also something right. that you can just put on, like, two in some cases to stop Smash to Smithereens, which is one of the few yeah. ways that you can sometimes lose some of these games. Yep, yeah. I've noticed that before for sure. Yeah, so I I might be inclined to go, like, Revokers out, Crusaders out, and keep the Recruiter package. Like, it's not, it's in a vacuum not good against Delver decks, but it's something that can just serve as additional copies of Stoneforge Mystic. Right. So this, this is sort of my generic recommendation, but, like, you can also adjust play draw. Like, the, yeah. the recruiters are a little better on the play and a little worse on the draw. So it might be the sort, right. of, sort of thing where, like, you might play this configuration in game two, and then you see, like, oh, they have Grim Lava Mancers, you know, maybe I'll do something like this instead for game three or, or something like that. Right. So, yeah, a little flexibility there, I think, is important. Okay, makes sense. All right. Uh, so now you have blue black shadow. This one is a little more interesting to talk about. Yeah, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Still, I'm actually surprisingly I'm one and two against shadow. I think I've not. I didn't draw very well in one of those matches, like I was telling you earlier. But um, people say it's a great matchup for D and T, but I don't know if they get uh, off to one of those like. Quick starts. It's pretty bad. You don't have swords to plowshares in your hand. I do think it is a very good matchup, but like I think you need to kind of be aware of like what's how your opponent is sideboarding because it really how do I say this? How your opponent sideboards should change how you sideboard a lot. Because you have yeah. to anticipate things like a whole bunch of Dread of Knights coming in. Right. Let's see. Yeah, feel free to just blow my plan up and correct me, because I don't think I've got this right at all. Alright, so this... First of all, this this fairy should not be coming in at all. That's... So, so, so the reason I'm bringing it in, and maybe this is too cute, is that I wanted a card that didn't just die to Dread of Knight and can be equipped without being affected by it. And so because Macabre is black, at least you can, like, vial it in and have a thing to equip that isn't dead on the board. But maybe that's, like, too cute. So you've got Stoneforges, Avengers, Revokers, Jailer, Prelate, Crusaders that will live through that. Yeah. That's, that's okay. And you also have Germ Token as well. So yeah. I, I think this is just living too much in fear. Okay. Um, I also don't think that Chalice is good in this matchup. <laughs> I, That's, is it again because you're shutting off your ones and swords yeah. is so good? So this this is because like it's very good when you play loam. So that's why I'm. Oh yes. So Chalice of the Void is one of the absolute best cards versus Blue Black Death Shadow. Yeah. But what are the best cards in this matchup from the DNT side? Well, <laughs> Vile, Sword of Plowshares, Mom, and Path to Exile. Crap. Yeah. So this this, this is I think an in. example of like card is good, but context is very important. Right. 
So maybe you want to be bringing in relic order and on the play and the draw, just because you figure they're going to board in Dread of Night. So, like with with a lot of the lists that I'm playing, I only board like four or five cards. Like a lot of times, like okay. when I'm on the play, I just board like two pass, two council judgments, and like a jailer if I'm playing one. Yeah. So, like, in your list, I think there's really only six cards to consider. So, like, these are, like, probably the six cards that you want to think about. Okay. So, these these were the cards that you were, you were thinking about playing. And I think play draw matters a lot here. So, let's, let's just go ahead and yeah. re resort these. Yeah. So, I think when you're on the play, Thalia is still good. Right, I agree. When you're on the draw, Thalia is is probably a little bit less good. So Jitte right. is not great in this matchup, unlike most other Delver variants, because their stuff gets really big. Yep. Uh, Revoker is pretty medium. And then... It does win Pro Tours, though, it, apparently. It sure does. <laughs> so, when I'm on the play, I'd probably do something that looks like this. You still want to tr trim a little bit of your one toughness stuff to head hedge against Dread of Night, but I'd probably do something like this. Okay. The Walking Ballista, while it doesn't really look all that great, it, it can be fine. Like you, I 100% want to play Ballista when I'm on the draw, so I'd either like board in these four or these five on the play. And if you want okay. to keep one more card, you keep in one more Flicker Wisp. It's just right. kind of like, do I want to have access to Walking Ballista, which can ping small stuff, or just finish them off? Okay. Uh, the other upside to Walking Ballista is, again, it's a colorless threat. Uh, then, that makes sense. Then when you're on the draw, I think you completely change your, your sideboarding plan. So yeah, instead, I would take out four Thalia, right? Yeah, all all the Thalias are going to go. The the Jitte mm -hmm. is still very bad, and then you need to trim yeah. one other card, which is probably going to be a Revoker, like either a Revoker okay. or a Flicker Wisp. Right. And then now you're bringing in Relic Order. Yeah. Yeah. So on on the draw, you just want to have more answers to like Dread of Night and something like Bitter Blossom, if they're playing that, just something that can kind of get out yeah. ahead of you and really stop you from doing your primary game plan. Yeah, and I think Shadow's interesting. Like, when I was... When I started out with Loam, I started out 1-4 and four against Shadow, and then since then I've won 11 in a row, I think. So I think it just takes a little practice to figure out how to play against it with the deck, and then... Once you do, it's easy. It's a good matchup. All right. So I think that covers all the, the various Delver variants. Um, why don't we go into some combo? Yeah. So now yeah. you you have Ant and Tess being set up the same way. Uh, yeah, I think that they're virtually the same as far as like how you board. Obviously a little different when you're playing, but I don't think you change the sideboard plan at all. Although maybe I'm incorrect on that. Well, the thing is that the Stoneforge Mystic package is way better against Tess than versus Ant, because Tess okay. is much more likely to go all in on goblins, and then Stoneforge yeah. can potentially beat that. Whereas Ant okay. tries not to win with goblins. So should I just like separate them rather than having them be the same? Well, why don't we look at your generic plan and go from there? Okay. All right. Because I, I, I think you're going to want to separate them. So let's let's right. look at your generic plan. So your generic plan is Swords yeah. of Plowshares out, Jitte out. Yeah. Trim some wisps and trim the jailer. Mm -hmm. And what are you boarding in? You're boarding in Surgicals, a Council's Judgment, a Rest in Peace, a Fairy. And two Jalices. Play, play order. And then also Relic Order, too. Okay. Yep, that's it. So, let's say we're playing against Ant. If we're playing against Ant, these Graveyard Hate cards can do a decent amount of work. 
Is that true if you're playing against Tess, though? Uh, I guess not as much, no. That's right. Yeah, so against... I don't think they're as good as Tess. Like, with, with Loam, I'm still bringing in Ley Lines, but that's probably because, you know... You have a lot of bad cards support out there. Yeah, yeah. So, like, for example, Tess can get a tiny bit of mana from its graveyard with the Rite of Flames, and every once in a, a blue moon, they, they will do a Past and Flames kill. But most of the time in this matchup, you know, your opponent is just going to poop a bunch of goblins and just say, like, all right, can you beat this? And the answer is usually no. Yeah. So, like, Rest in Peace, yeah. for example, is super slow against Tess. And, like, some of these other cards are anemic as well. So let's okay. let's kind of start with Ant here. Uh, yeah. Against Ant, I would certainly be comfortable bringing all of this stuff in. You know, you kind of bring in a Council Judgment as a hedge against... Uh, you know, a dread of night coming in. You know, right? If you, if you, although, go, it, go ahead. Well, it's probably massacre um, from most builds I see, but I mean, it's not entirely useless. Like sometimes Ant will just play out an LED and do nothing, and you can get to turn three and hit the LED. Yeah, and it's actually but, correct for them to play out their artifact mana a lot of time because of Thalia. Yeah, well, and Chalice if they know it's in there. Yes. Um. So, like, versus Ant, I'm fine with bringing in these eight cards. Although, if I see they're playing, like, a Massacre or in, in game two, I'll usually board this out. Right. So, these are the cards that I'd consider. Uh, yeah, Swords of Plowshares and, and Jitte are miserable, and then Palace Jailer is awful, and then Trimming Flicker Wisp is fine. So I think this is, is probably a fine configuration for Ant. And then versus Tess, like, Council Judgment loses a lot of its utility because you're not making it to three mana before they do something in almost any cases. Right. Similarly, Rest in Peace is terribly slow. Fairy's super narrow. And... Like, you really only have five good cards for the matchup, unfortunately. And... So you still think Surgical is good enough, even though they're... Oh, no, I don't really think Surgical is good enough, but we're playing it. <laughs> so <laughs> Fair. The thing about Surgical is that if they just go and, like, cast an Infernal Tutor to build up their hand, you can try to, like, get the rest of the Infernal Tutors. So, like... Yeah. There's some worlds where this is really impactful. Whereas, like, Fairy, for example, what are, what are you going to do? You're going to keep them off of one mana with a Rite of Flame. And, you know, if they're to the point where yeah, they're going I, off, they try to avoid Past and Flames kills. Fairy has won me games against Ant by itself, but I could see it being pretty awful against Tess. So, like, I would not blame you for boarding this in versus Tess just going like, well, maybe this will do something, and a lot of my cards are just yeah. so bad. Yeah. So uh, Clearly like, with those five, you're boarding out the Swords and the Jailer, because those are just awful. Yeah, so like, these these six cards here are really rough. Like, Jitte in some worlds can get you out from under Goblins, especially if, like, yeah. provided with Crusader. If you want, you right. can just play Palace Jailer as one-sided draw, because, like, they can never, ever, ever become the Monarch, basically. That's but, true. But, like, this is a four-mana tap-out card. Uh, not really where you <laughs> want to be. No. Yeah. Um, this matchup is actually kind of one of the reasons why I go and, like, I play three Chalice of the Voids in my sideboard. Like, it's definitely overkill, but against these, like, yeah. quick artifact mana decks, just, like, having the extra cards that you can board in that feel good, it's it's very important. So here's the thing, and this is one of those changes that I've been considering. If I were to play a third Chalice, I would take out Fairy. Agreed. Um, however, I will say that Fairy has been absurd at certain times when everything else would be bad. Like There's, there's the a animator, lot of Black Red Reanimator online. Yeah, against Reanimator on the draws where they have Chancellor, Fairy is absurd. Because generally, when some when a Reanimator player has a Chancellor trigger, and then they also have the hand to go off, they'll just do it. 
And if you have Fairy in your hand, it gets around Chancellor, and then you just win the game. So um, that's the reason, the main reason I've been playing it. I also just like it at, against decks like Lands and Loam as well. Although Surgical is very good there too. I think Macabre is also good. And I like that it can sometimes be a 2-2 flyer. That's been relevant at times as well. Um, in, but... in my history of playing d and I think I have vialed in a fairy once. <laughs> hey, I did it against Loam and it won me the game. So Yeah, yeah, say that. It, it can happen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm not depending on it. I mean, I'm assuming that your opinion is to <laughs> play three Chalice over the Fairy. I'm just taking a guess. Um, I, I felt like Chalice of the Void is just an absurd sideboard card right now. Like, I know yeah. in the matchups that we've talked about so far, a lot of times it's like, well, no, you don't really want it here, even though it's a good card. But, like, in the control matchups, for example, just, like, slamming a Chalice on one versus Miracles and watching them just, like, flounder around and die has felt so good. So let me ask you this then before I uh, jump to making that change, because I'm willing to make that change. Macabre has been my least favorite sideboard card overall. Everything else has felt very good in certain spots. Um, do you think that playing two Surgicals and one Rest in Peace is enough Graveyard Hate? Uh, you also have the Containment Priest. Sure, that's true. So Do you think that's enough? Because another matchup where I really like Fairy is against Dredge. Yeah, so historically... Like, going back a year or two, D&T, like, a lot of times used to play, like, six pieces of Graveyard Hate. Like, there, yeah. there was a long time where, like, I would show up to a tournament with, like, two Surgical, two Rest in Peace, two Containment Priest, or something like that. Right. And then Recruiter got printed, and that kind of let you skimp a little bit more on the Graveyard Hate, because sometimes you could tutor it up. Yeah. Um, rest in Peace kind of right now is at a worse place than it's been in a long time yeah i agree i think it's too slow but i still like one because it's such a house against lands yeah against uh, like on, the on. like fair graveyard decks rest in peace is is just brutal um, yeah let me see if i can pull up a somewhat recent dnt deck list let's see what i was doing uh that's not that one so here's what i ran at scg con and I was actually just down to three pieces of Graveyard Hate for that weekend. Okay. Um, which All is, right. like, uh... definitely skimping. And probably yeah. not what I would run right now. Uh, the issue is that, like, you kind of get to choose, do I want to run more Chalice of the Voids, or do I want to run more Graveyard Hate? And it is an active choice. Like, you, you make matchups worse based on your decision. Uh, that's fair. I think that... I agree with you, and I'm willing to make that change. All right. So let's just make the assumption that we're playing with three Chalice and no Fairy. Uh, because that is a, car a card I've been considering cutting. It has won me a couple games, but it's also like, A, it's rarely boarded in. B, it often feels worse than Surgical and unnecessary. Okay. Um, and C, you're right, I rarely ever buy it in. And also, Chalice is just like so good in certain matchups, especially the combo matchups. So I think I'm willing to like just make that change now yeah so that the only matchup that'll change your boarding for is like the ant and test matchups where, you, where you'll have one more card to bring in and it's pretty easy to pick yeah. up the bad cards yeah so i'm assuming against tests like we were talking about you want four swords and a jailer and the fifth card is probably jit or a wisp right yep I would say Wisp is probably, like, one Wisp is okay. Because yeah. I think, like you said, there's the corner world where Jit gets you out of a goblin situation. But All right. So next you have Eldrazi. Yeah. This one's pretty easy, I think, because there's, like, some clear terrible cards. All right. So, so you were cutting this, this, and these. Yep. And you were bringing in Council's Judgment, Leon Relic Order, Path, Priest, Cataclysm, Ballista. All right, mm -hmm. uh, let me just confirm something. When you say Colorless Eldrazi, do you mean like the Eldrazi aggro deck? 
I'm talking about Eldrazi Stompy right now, yeah. Okay. The one that isn't playing uh, post cards. Yep, gotcha. Okay. So... You, you may be overboarding a touch. So... These five cards are absolute garbage, and Thalia's are not good. Yeah. The, the question is, now, I think these five cards are, are very clearly good, and I think these cards are more medium. Right, I agree. So, some number of Thalia's may be better than some of these. Sure. So, for example... Let's let's just kind of think about the matchup. When you've been playing it, what what games do you lose? Uh, well, I am one and one against it, so okay. Little ex very little experience thus far against that matchup with this deck. Uh, I think I'm losing the match that I lost. I'm pretty sure was because he just. Uh, got out, you know, like with, with the Eldrazi deck, when they, and it's the same thing with Loam, when they get out their really fast start, like they're going like, um, like Chalice on one's pretty good in that matchup against DNT because it shuts off all your removal. So they'll go like Chalice on one and into like I and Mimic, and then they'll go like turn two, Thought Not You, turn three, Smasher, and just so much pressure so quickly. I think that's where you have a harder time. Okay, you're right. So... Their, their best draws are the ones where they, they are the aggro deck. Yeah. Is Cataclysm going to be good? Probably not. It's probably a little loose. I think it's much, much better against Eldrazi Post. Right. So, especially since, like, a lot of times, if you cast a Cataclysm, they'll keep a soul land, and if they draw another, it's like, well, crap, they can already cast Thought Not Seers. Yeah, you did nothing, right? Yeah, so your mana is probably more valuable than theirs. Yeah, I would agree. So uh, that makes sense. I'm boarding in Containment Priest only because it acts as a path to exile with um, Flicker Wisp. Flicker Wisp, yeah. Yeah. So Containment Priest and Ballista are both pretty medium. Um, but maybe they're better than Toothalia. Yeah, I've. I've moved to the side of, like, don't board in Ballista and keep a couple of Thalias, just because, like, Thalia and Ballista are kind of good against the same things, right? So, yeah. But Thalia is good against, like, both Eldrazi Mimic and uh, Matter Reshaper in that it can wall them, whereas right. Ballista is better against uh, specifically... Eldrazi Mimic, because, like, you can just pick it off on your turn very safely, and it's not potentially going yeah. to get bigger at all. Yeah. So, I mean, I think either way, you're keeping in two Thalias, and yeah. then, like, you just have to decide, do I want these more than these? And, you right. know, I'll tell you that a lot of times when I play this matchup, I usually end up trimming two Thalias. It's, it's awkward okay. to, like, have your swords and your paths alongside these, like, Council's Judgments when those are super important cards. So you don't actually want too many Thalias. So I would I would be fine boarding like this, just kind of knowing that both of these cards are whatever. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I had a quick side question. How do you feel about Canonist? When we were talking about adding a third Chalice, is there any world in your mind where that's just the Canonist instead? Uh, I have not or considered... Or do you think Chalice is just better? I have not considered Canonist as a sideboard card since the summer. Okay. I, like... It is still a fine card, but I think mm -hmm. Canonist is not winning me very many games of Magic. And I feel like Chalice yep. is. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's like, you know, it's good in those, like, niche scenarios where you're, like, you know, it's good against Elves and stuff, but I think Chalice is probably just more impactful most of the time. All right. Which, by the way, I was very happy to win my first match against Elves, and that was, like, one of the first matches I played with D&T, and I won 2-0. I was very surprised. Yeah, don't uh, don't get used to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hey, Revoker on uh, uh, Heritage Druid's pretty good. Yes, I mean sometimes you get there. Yeah. 
All right. Anyway. So next up. So is... here's a matchup. Depths. Yeah. Here's yeah. a matchup where I was 100% guessing. I have no idea. So please just guide me. I, okay. I don't know. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do in this matchup. And I just put depths because there's like turbo depths and there's slow depths. And I don't know. Gen generally <laughs> speaking, the, the same sort of cards are going to be good against all of them. You, you're probably not going to have to worry too much. You're probably going to be boarding in the right things. All right. So yeah. you wanted to board in Council's Judgment, Path, Surgical, Leon and Relic Order. Yep. Okay. The, the stuff that you're boarding in is probably fine. The Surgicals are the loosest slots there. I, I yeah, understand I just like the... wanting to just, like, pull all of the Dark Depths from the deck. Yeah. In my experience, that hasn't worked out as well as I thought it would. But it, it does just end the games a lot of times. So, like, I get wanting yeah. to keep it. Yeah. I also think it can be good, like, if they're on slow depths, I think it's better because of Loam. Yes. Um, and I also think it just can be good in certain situations where, like, say they land a Hex Mage and you kill it and you surgical it, then you're taking out four pieces, you know. I mean, it's like, I found it to be playable. Okay. So, I'm, I'm looking at what you're boarding out. Um, I have no idea. I really don't. Yeah, that, that, no that, idea. that's clear with, like, this assortment of creatures. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask you a stupid question, all right? So, how yeah, do you lose the game it. against Depths? Uh, well, you're definitely losing when they, like, turn to Hex Mage, Dark Depths, get a 20-20, and you don't have an answer. Okay. So, the way that we lose this game is getting whacked for 20 in the face, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, with our main deck cards, how can we stop a 20-20? Uh, well, a lot, you got lots of ways, really. Wasteland, Swords of Plowshares... Uh, Sarah Avenger blocks it, Flicker Wisp exiles it. I mean, I know that historically this is a good matchup for Death and Taxes. Right. You, I mean, Flicker Wisp alone off of Vile, they can't beat. So. Good. So, we want to potentially have the options to block that card, right? Yeah. Mom plus a flyer blocks Merit Lodge forever. Right, because it's black. Yeah, then yeah. the only way that they can win is, like, using something like Sejiri Step to force damage through your pro-black creatures. Yep. So I would actually not cut these. I think Mirror Crusader is a great card in the matchup. Okay. Because a lot of times you cast a Source of Plowshares and give them 20 life. Mirror Crusader yep. hits like a truck. And it's one of those cards that, like, can really help force you through some of their ground, but ground-based blockers as well. So sometimes you see things like, you know, Dark Confidant coming in, or things like the Vampire Hex Mages that have First Strike. And I think Mirror Crusader is quite good there. Yeah. So I actually think the weakest thing in this matchup is probably your equipment package. So a lot of times for this matchup, like, the first things I go to gut are just going to be these seven cards. Okay. And you have, you have seven that you want to board out. Or, sorry, that you want to board in. So, like, that's just something to consider, is, like, if this is the weakest part of your deck, because, like, if things are going well, you don't need to kill them quickly. Right? Like, if you can disrupt them, you can beat them to death over five turns, yeah. and, that, and that's That fine. makes total sense, and I'm not really sure why I didn't see that, but... So, like... The... I guess I just thought that, like, Stoneforge... I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, um, the, the only reason to, like, keep some of the Stoneforge Mystic Package around is because, like, a Jitte connection or a Batter Skull connection can put you above 20 life, and so you can survive a hit. Yeah, I guess I thought Jitte was good against stuff like Hex Mage and Bob out of the Slow Depths version, but maybe and like Spirit Keeper or not Spirit Keeper, um, Safe Keeper. Yep. 
So, like, there's definitely reasons to keep some of this stuff around, but, yeah. like, it's definitely a weaker portion of your deck. Okay. So, like, if, if you want to board in the Surgicals, you will probably be boarding out at least five of the seven. Okay. Like, if you want, you can, like, just keep this in and trim something else instead. The, the issue being that, like, basically your entire main deck is good against them. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's that's true. So, like, um, personally, I don't usually board these in, and I usually only board in about five cards. So, um, I might keep, like, Jitte and Sword, or, like, Jitte and One Stone Forge or something like that. Just because, like, yeah. naturally drawing a piece of, like, one piece of equipment over the course of the game is okay. The, the biggest issue that is makes that, sense. like... This is super mana intensive to like be using equipment. So like right. when you're afraid of tapping out, these are just dead cards. Makes right. sense. Is, is that enough guidance there? Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward matchup. Uh, I like playing depths that decks that have good matchups against depth, so that's been nice because Loam is very also very good there. So never been a matchup I've been too concerned with. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to answer a chat question. Uh, so someone was asking yeah. about Storm as a entry point into Legacy. And, like, Storm is a somewhat linear combo deck that you can get better at by gold fishing. So, like, if you want to just, like, learn how your deck works, you can sit in your room for hours and just, like, goldfish lines. But that being said... The game ones with Storm are easy. It's games two and three where you have to sideboard and figure out like what your opponent is going to do. Um, that can be really tricky. So while like you can learn to play a Storm deck at a somewhat okay level quickly on your own, you're maybe not going to get the cool interactive side of Legacy early on because I think you're gonna like kind of have to take your licks while you're learning your deck. Yeah, and I think Storm is one of those decks where, like, you can play it, and it's fine, but the level of difficulty to master it is very high. If you want to, like, just look at videos where Cyrus CG, Cyrus Corman Gill, plays Storm, because I think he's the best there is with the deck. He is, like, the master yeah. in my mind. He so. is crushing recently. He's incredible. He won. He's won. He's winning everything with that deck. He crushes me online. He crushes everybody. He just like knows that thing inside and out. So, if you ever want to know how to play Storm? Just watch him. All right. So next up, you have versus D and T. Uh, there are five really bad main deck cards. So yeah. those are very Pretty easy. very easy cuts. Um, Path to Exile is an awkward card. It's fine it is. to play. I shouldn't know mirror. what the fifth card is. Yeah, like I don't like containment priest in the mirror. Sometimes people board it in, like, oh, I'll stop yeah. your vials. It'll be fine. And then yeah. like you turn on their flicker wisp as just like a nuclear missile, and it's like, oh, this was not fine at all. Yeah. Or like you draw it on your vial hands and it's just a dead card. Um Yeah, the mirror is definitely one like I would like to Maybe in another future session, I would like to sit down with you and play the mirror a bunch of times or, like, figure it out because it's one that definitely feels like you need experience with, and I, I'm one and one against it, but it's, like, seems difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe that the D&T mirror oftentimes ends up being as close as magic gets to, like, chess, where yep. it's just like, all right... There are all these things that can happen. How do I wiggle through this in the safest way? Right. Um, but then again, there are other games where it's like, all right, turn one, vile. Turn two, port you. Turn three, put in my stone port, get Jitte. Turn four, F. <laughs> and like, the <laughs> yeah. game just ends. Yeah. But, yeah, I've definitely won a game like that before, and I've lost a game like that. So, And I feel like play draw is pretty important for that reason. But I, I could talk about the D&T mirror forever. Like, some of my most yeah. enjoyable and memorable games of Magic are, like, D&T mirrors versus other great players. Yep. I All can right. see that. Um, so then you've got Maverick next, which is 
going to be conceptually very similar. Yeah, let me just say, and maybe I'm playing it wrong, you can correct <laughs> me, that matchup feels horrendous. Um, your matchup knowledge matters a lot. I think, like, historically, I'm definitely winning that match far more than I'm losing it. The, the Maverick players okay. tend to really think that they're favored. Um, well, it may have also been because I played against Dan Neely, who's an oh, incredible Magic yeah, Maverick sure. player. Okay, yeah. And I got just fucking destroyed, so... Against the average person who shows up to a tournament, I feel favored versus Maverick. Versus, like, yeah. a Maverick player whose name I go, it's like, all right, well, this one's going to be... This one's going to be a slog. Yeah. All right, so you're boarding out Dahlia, Prelate, a Wisp, and a Mom. You're boarding in... Council's Judgment, Cataclysm, Relic Order, Rest in Peace. No Cataclysm. I, it shouldn't be Cataclysm. It's just Council's Judgment, Relic Order, Path, Ballista, and Rest in Peace. Oh. Oh, sorry. I started looking at the next line. Okay, I see. All right, so... Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, so, so seven for seven. Um... Mom's really important. Okay. Like, they they have much larger creatures than you in Knight, and so just stonewalling that is important. Using Mom to blank equipment activations is important. And similarly, like, Flicker Wisp is a great tool. Like, we can trim one if we need to, but I'm going to try to keep all those in the deck. Just because, like, the matchup is so interactive and so many things can go wrong that... Like, Flicker Wisp as a safety net is great. So Yeah, that makes sense. I just didn't know what to cut, because I think you want second path and rip for night. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, like, these these are seven cards that are totally reasonable. And I think, like, the, the question you have to ask is, like, how highly do I value Path to Exile versus, like, how many other cards do I want in the deck? Because I, I don't think yeah. very many of these cards are reasonable cuts. Okay. So, like... Maybe you just board the same way, then, as d &T. Like, the the Rest in Peace probably needs to come in. Yeah. It's it's an awkward card, because on the, their non-Knight draws, it can be just abysmal and do literally nothing. But then, in other hands, it will just absolutely win you the game. And there's there's so many cards they can play, you know, scavenging ooze, Ramunap excavator, knight, you know, yep. even loan yep. or something like that. Um, e even Punching the occasional fire, like even. yeah, or even sword of light and shadow is not uncommon in their sideboards. Oh god, I, let me tell you, <laughs> Dan equipped sword of light and shadow to a knight, and I just died. <laughs> I just died. We also had scrib ranger. It was bad. Yeah. Uh, Tux Dev in chat said, Flicker Wisp, win target, unwinnable game. Yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of my yeah. thought. Yeah. So this is this is a time where like you can consider cutting Palace Jailer. It can be awesome, but it can be hard to find a good spot. It's it's a deck where like you both have moms. And, like, they have some random flyers, like Scrib Ranger, that can be flashed in. Um, I don't know that I want... I don't think we can board... Risky. I don't think we can board in two paths. I, I just don't think you have enough slots. And okay. I can understand wanting to have a Ballista, just because, like, it can take out their mobs, it can take out some of their, their mana dorks if they're playing them, like, you know, Noble Hierarch or, or Dryad Arbors, yeah. even. Yeah. So I think you have six cards to board in, and you probably trim one of Palace Jailer or Flicker Wisp as your last cut. Yeah, I think Jailer makes sense given that it's just like high risk with their the way that they're playing the game. But it also is like pretty game ending if you can get it online too. Yeah, like when Jailer works, the game is over. When yeah. Jailer doesn't work, it's it's very expensive. Like sometimes they're wastelanding you. You know, you don't really want to tick up your vial to four. So, like, right. you, you, you make a choice here between one of these two cards. 
Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Oh, miracles. If you want to move on to that, I've, uh, I'm 4 1 against miracles, which is nice. The matchup has felt better than it does with Loam. Like I was telling you earlier, not having to worry as much about back to basics and counterbalance is really nice. Cataclysm is insane. Um, All right, so you're boarding. Yeah. Cataclysm, Council Judgment, Chalice. Let's see. Ballista. Well, now we have to find an extra slot because of uh, I'm having a third Chalice now. So. Oh, okay. So you're boarding. Rest in peace. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, hold oh, on, I'm missing one of your, and Relic Order. Yeah, so it should be 10 now. Okay, I see. Um, rest in Peace is maybe not good enough. If you think about it from their perspective, I think a lot of times they would be just fine with you casting a Rest in Peace, right? Yeah, but I mean, it does shut down eight of their cards, AK and Snap. Sure. Is that worth a card? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that, like, so far in my experience playing against Miracles, I haven't needed it. I'll say that. So, like, just kind of think about a lot of your games. Let's say it's turn 10. There's been a lot of back and forth. Would you rather draw this Rest in Peace, or would you rather draw this Mirror Crusader? That's fair. I'm still going to have to take out one other card for the ninth spot. But yeah, I, I guess I guess you're right. I think I like Rip a lot more in the Grixis Control matchup. Agreed. So I think here, Rest in Peace doesn't give you enough value. Like, yeah. if they haven't accumulated knowledge, they still just cycle it. If they have a Snapcaster mm -hmm. Mage, it can still trade with, you know, a naked Stoneforge or Revoker or just can be, like, flashed in to protect a Planeswalker or something. So yeah. I don't necessarily think this is good enough. I, I think these other nine cards are fine. So, like, okay. when you're playing Chalice, these are easy cuts, and then you just need to trim one other creature. Trimming a Crusader is fine. Um, How do you feel about trimming the Batter Skull? Trimming the batter skull's fine. Like it's very bad against Jace, for example, and yep. also not yep. great against Teferi if they're playing that. The thing is that uh, like this matchup goes long, and if you trim a piece of equipment from your deck, sometimes you just don't have a fetch target anymore, yeah. and so you like lose out on value. Uh, with yep. your exact list, I would consider trimming Sarah Avenger instead of Crusader because you are playing a Cavern of Souls that presumably you're going to put on human. Right. Okay. But uh, otherwise, I like what I see see here. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, the matchup I've found to be pretty good if you know how to navigate it, and I've had a lot of experience playing against Miracles, so that helps, but... Um... Yeah, so Con Connor, comment for you. Hello, just stopping in, because I noticed that you were on, and I want to say thanks for the Four Color Loam video. It was great, and I plan on tuning in when you're streaming in the future. Thanks, yeah. Uh, I appreciate that. I should be streaming again soon. It's just a matter of um, getting my setup figured out so I don't have lag anymore. Since I play grindy decks, lag is a big problem, and I don't really want to be timing out on stream to everything that I normally would have 10 minutes left in, so I'm just trying to figure that out, but otherwise I'll be back streaming soon. But I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I, I think like this matchup to me is about Basically, you're playing the long game, but you're also setting up to try and deplete them of resources to the point where you can Cataclysm them for the win. Because if you draw Cataclysm, they don't have any way of taking it out of your hand. So you just sit there and wait to cast it, and then when you cast it at the right time, they just lose the game. That's basically what I found. Yeah, so this, this is a matchup where the roles are variable very frequently. So, like, yeah. there's plenty of games where, like, they're the control deck, and you have to try to be the aggro deck and get in as much ship damage as they can before they stabilize. And then there's yeah. other games where, like, 
you're playing like Thalia and porting them, or you play like Chalice and then a follow-up threat, and now you're you're the control deck and you're limiting their options. So you just have to be super aware of what your role is. Yeah, and against like so like with Loam, I like setting up like game one with Loam. You set up the lock with Teague and Chalice, so they can't terminus or swords you. And uh, you could do a similar thing here. I like setting up like the Mom Prelate on six lock too. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so Ben Ben in chat there. Um, context is always key, right? Like, Mom is a fine card versus Miracles, right? It can protect against, like, Swords of Plowshares. That's awesome. But when we're bringing in three Chalices for the post-sideboard games, then the power of our Moms goes down a lot, right? So this is the sort of thing that, because of the sideboard cards we're playing, this card becomes worse. Normally against Miracle, I'll trim a couple of moms anyway, just because, like, there's Terminus and, and Supreme Verdict, and to a lesser extent, things like um, Engineered Explosives to worry about. But mom's a fine card in the matchup, but in this configuration with Chalices, we, we don't want it. Alright, um, so now Grix's control. We'll... Yep. Also, a matchup that people have told me repeatedly is bad for DNT, but I'm 2-0 against it. I know that's a very small sample size, but I don't think it's as bad as people think. Um, it's... People have also told me that you need Spirit Keeper to win. I also disagree with that. Hollowed Spirit Keeper is an awesome, awesome bullet to have for the matchup, but it is largely yeah. for that matchup. Like, yes. it's, it's not a great card as a whole. It's very much so I played... your non-white mid-range decks. Yeah, when I started with DNT for the first few days I was playing like XJ Clouds list with like the cleric and the spirit keeper and the ballista main mm -hmm. um, and eventually I switched to two Avenger and this is just my personal opinion I'm not saying it's right or wrong but I've liked Avenger much more than spirit keeper in general um, there are a lot of games where I drew spirit keeper and I was like this is terrible a lot of games where I drew it and it's main and they have source of plot shares and you're like this is terrible um, and Avengers just overall felt better. I get that Spirit Keepers like the house against Grixis control, but I felt okay in the matchup without it. I also felt the same way about Cleric. Largely, I thought Cleric was a 2-1 flyer for two, and I'm like, why am I playing a 2-1 flyer for two in Legacy? Again, that's me. I get that it helps you out with graveyard matchups game one, but I don't think it's impactful enough. Yeah, Rem Remorseful Cleric is like... An awesome main deck tutor target, but as as a whole, it can be a, a somewhat anemic card. So like, I I get your frustration with that. I've yeah, I I just like having the three three flyer because so much hate against DNT comes in the form of like dread of night, marsh casualties, like x one x like minus one minus one cards, and having a three three body on a flyer that has vigilance is like so good. Um, however, this is one of the matchups where it sucks, and I get that, like, in a Baleful Strix world, it's garbage, so I cut it, but yeah. I've also noticed a lot less Strix overall lately. Agreed. Okay, so Grix is control now. So we added one more Chalice, so that's going to be one more slot. Uh, I think all the yep. stuff that you're bringing in is, is fine, and uh, now we've got to think about boarding out. I think if we're adding another Chalice, we probably just want to cut all our non-Aether Vial 1 drops. Including swords? You don't like any swords for, like, Angler? I mean, except Gurmag Angler, that card is just, like, garbage against them, right? Like, yeah. you don't want a Swords of Strix, you don't want a Swords of Snapcaster, it's just, like, the wrong side of the value equation. Right. Uh, the sort of, like, awkward thing is that your, your extra flex slots of Sarah Avenger are just, like, super bad in this matchup. So maybe it's right to keep in one swords since I've got nine. Like we have, we have to keep two two of these cards. I just think in terms of math, like one swords the plowshares. I don't know that you're gonna like draw it at the right time or draw it when you don't have a chalice on one. I'd be more inclined to just keep in some creatures but like again they aren't fantastic either yeah i mean i guess you can keep in one avenger i mean avenger's could. not 
not always terrible. Like, if you can deal with Strix, it's pretty good against, like, a Jace or something. And it, it's good against ending the game. It's good against, like, Last Hope, stuff like that. So it's not just, like, useless. I'd probably begrudgingly keep in two Avengers. But if you want to play a Swords, I'd keep in one Swords and one Avenger. Do you still cut one Flicker Wisp? I think so. Like, Flicker Wisp is a great card, but in this matchup, like, your vials get blown up such a huge proportion of the time that you're not getting to do the shenanigans that you do in a, a lot of other matchups. And I find it's, like, yeah. hard to set up, like, good value blink things, since there's almost nothing on the other side of the table that you want to blink. So the upside of right. Sarah Avenger coming down quicker off of Vile and just being less mana intensive is probably better. Yeah, that's true. I think it's like, like if you can deal with Baleful Strixes, then Avenger can end the game. Uh, and Nerf Blaster, thank you very much for, for resubbing for nine months now. That's basically forever. Thank you for your support. It means a lot. I do think, however, that this is another matchup where Cataclysm just wins. It's the reason that you play two in the board. Um, I see a lot of people playing Gideon. I started with Gideon. Gideon's good. There's nothing wrong with Gideon. It's a good card. It's a good sideboard card. But uh, I've noticed that Gideon doesn't really do anything when you're ahead, and it doesn't do enough to get you back when you're behind. Um, and Cataclysm is the card that lets you win these games that you are way behind in. So Gideon is a card that is more generic, so it can come in yeah. for many more matchups. So for example, it's a card that's for control matchups that also comes in against a lot of the mid-range decks. So it would give you right, like it's a card you two can more cards against like Eldrazi. Yeah, and Eldrazi, yeah. No, I get that. It's just that the power of Cataclysm is so insane right now. Yeah, when there's a lot of Planeswalker and land-heavy decks running around, it's a good place to be. Yeah. Like, my, my last list I played, I think, had three Palace Jailers, and I'd probably run uh, two Cataclysms over the other Jailers now. There's just, like, a little bit too much Eldrazi post running around. Yeah, it's that. It's also, like, I've had Cataclysm be game-ending against lands, too, and there's still a fair amount of lands online, at least. Um, and, like, when they're sitting there, dirtling around, setting up, like, triple maze with their Thespian stages, ports, all this stuff, and you Cataclysm them, and they just die, it's pretty great. So, all right. So, because lands doesn't really have the ability to come back once you've blown up all their lands. <laughs> so, all right. So next up we have Reanimator, which will probably be really straightforward. The equipment package yeah. is abysmal. So, yep, I'm boarding out all the equipment package, all the moms and a wisp, and you have 13 cards to bring in or whatever it is. So. Yeah, so, all right, so what doesn't come in? So Cataclysm doesn't come in, and... There's one other one that doesn't. I think it's Ballista. Yeah. Everything else is in. Yep, and so we took Fairy out, so there's now one more Chalice in here instead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so just, just to say this in case you play a non-Chalice build... In the non-Chalice builds, you tend to keep Mom in, because Mom plus yep. a Flyer, Stone Walls, like Grizzlebrand, for example. Yeah. Uh, but in the yeah. Chalice builds, uh, this just becomes so much weaker. Uh, this is also right. the matchup where Chalice is awkward. Most of the other time, you can board out most of your one-drops when you're bringing in Chalice. But in this matchup, it's like, well, a lot of these cards matter a lot. Hopefully this Chalice does something. If it doesn't, I hope I don't draw too many one-drops. Yeah, I think you have to board them in because it gives you, like, all right. I mean, you hope that, like, either my hand has, like, a bunch of sword shares and paths for their creatures or, like, an early chalice on one. Um, and then you hope that either one of those gets you there. And, I mean, obviously, like, you're boarding in three chalice together with two path and two third surgical, so it's, like, really awkward and strange. But because against reanimator, your opening hand is, like, pretty much all that matters. You know, you want your hand to have something and it that works. All right, so next up we're going to have lands. Yeah. Um Should take Crusader Thalia Mom. Two Stone Forge. 
the fairy doesn't come in anymore, so that's minus one card. All right, so we've got path, cataclysm, surgical, rip, no, no more fairy, no Leon and Relic, Relic Warder, and Council's Council's Judge. Judge. Yeah. Okay. So, I was I was waiting for this moment. Uh, no, please bring it. <laughs> I don't actually board in Cataclysm in this matchup. No. <laughs> Why does not compute, Phil? Does okay. not compute. So it's won me like I don't know how many games so far. I'm three zero against lands, and Cataclysm has been pretty good. Yes. I might have to disagree with you here, but give me the reasoning. So here here's my experience versus lands. Against lands, Cataclysm is good only when you have another piece to back it up. So, for example, right. Cataclysm plus Rest in Peace or Surgical is probably lights out. Yeah. But Cataclysm on its own does not beat this deck. So, yeah. they will rebuild faster and more efficiently than you. Like, if they have Loam... And especially if they have like loam and exploration, like your your cataclysm doesn't actually buy you that much time. Yeah. So this is a card that I personally don't board in in the lands matchup, but that I think is fine to board in in the lands matchup. I like cataclysm yeah. more as you are playing more grave hate. Well, let's go through the eight cuts for the other eight cards, and then you can tell me the extra two that you would cut if I were to bring in Cataclysm. Yeah. Because I can see your point. I definitely see your point. The thing I let me say the thing I like about Cataclysm, like I agree that it's like it's not gonna end the game if you don't have a rest in peace or a surgical, but in the games where they have set up like three maze of ifs yeah. plus two ports plus they have Loam online and all this other stuff going on. It's the only card in the deck that will like get you back into the game from being behind. And that's why I like it. I understand that it doesn't necessarily win you the game, but it's pretty tough to beat like triple maze of it plus whatever else when they have like twenty lands on the board. Yeah. So I hundred percent get that, but a lot of times my issue is that like, you know, you might have a board of like five creatures. They might have a board of like ten lands. And if you just go down to that like last one creature versus them, like a lot of times they can just keep that in check. Yeah. So. All right. That's true. But anyway. Yeah. Let's. We can agree to disagree or whatever. I might just need more experience to understand and agree with you. But let's do uh, the eight that you take out for sure. So this is this is kind of a hard one to board for. Yeah, I agree. You, I wasn't sure if I was right. You have to decide how much you're willing to dilute your deck. Yeah. Because like the cards like Council's Judgment and Relic Warder are okay. Like yeah. when they're just loaming, Council's Judgment does nothing. If they play out a creature, you don't really want to use this as a spell to answer their stuff. But at the same time, this is one of the few cards that can answer some of their problematic enchantments that they can play out. So Yeah, the other main reason I like Council's Judgment was an extra answer to Tireless Tracker. And as an ex-lands player, that card can take over the game if you don't have an answer. Yeah. So uh, this, this is a matchup that I've kind of gone back and forth a lot about how I want to sideboard. Yeah. So, like, let's start with what I think is, you know, pretty obviously correct. I think these these seven cards are really easy. You know? The Jitte, Two Crusader, and Fourth Alia. Yeah. yeah. So, like, Crusader is terrible against Punishing Fire. You're usually not really getting the mana-based lock on them. And, like... Jitte can stop against Punishing Fire, but it's awkward. This is not a stellar card in the matchup. Like, 
it can do things sometimes, but you have to have counters already for it to be good. Yeah. So, like, these are the six cards that I start with when I'm doing my boarding. And right. then if I want more from there, I usually go to Revokers and Jitte. Revoker is... So you don't like any Revoker? Revoker is nice if they're playing Molten Vortex. Yeah. But otherwise, I tend to cut this. Okay. Well, that is nine. Yeah. Uh, two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten. Is there one extra card you would cut? Because I know we're, like, in disagreement about Cataclysm, but I'm just trying to think of the first ten you're cutting. Yeah. So, like, the other... Like one Stoneforge, maybe? I think... So Stoneforge isn't necessarily the thing that you want to play early on, but it is important. Like, Sword of Fire and Ice Protection is huge in this matchup. Yeah, Sword of Fire and Ice is generally how I win the game, so... Yeah. So, like, if, if I were going to board with this list, I would probably consider doing something like this, 8 for 8. Yeah. Like, Jitte's not great, but, you know, it's a piece of equipment, the game's gonna be long, having the third one in the deck to fetch for, you know, that's that's okay. So, if I was going to go and keep those in... Yeah, just, if you keep Cataclysm in, you board out the Jitte, and what other card, I guess, is what I'm wondering. Like, if you're gonna do that, you might board out Jitte, and then, like, trim one Swords to Plowshares. Okay. Like, pa Path, generally speaking, is better than Path to Exile in this matchup. Like, you, yeah. you do want a critical number of removal spells to be pretty sure that you draw one for, like, tireless trackers. But, like, it's really awkward to sort Plowshares and Merit Lodge. You do it if you have to, but... Right. It's much harder to do 20 more damage to lands than, uh, like, Turbo Deaths. They have, they have more yep. interaction. Yeah, they do. I found it to be generally a good matchup so far, but I know it is a complex one, and it and it goes long. I, I, I feel favored against dependent. lands players when I don't know their name, but when I go yep. and sit down against like you know Daryl Ayers or someone like that, it's like, all right, here we go. Yeah, I sat I sat down against Jody Keith, and uh, I won game one, and then lost game two. And game three was a slog that I timed out on, and he had 25 seconds left, and we don't really know who was going to win. So, it's tight. Yeah. Um, so, just to mention one other thing, if your opponent is playing some sort of, like, Molten Vortex type thing, then you probably, like, keep a Revoker, maybe even both in the deck, and then, like, trim another Swords right. to Plowshares. Yep. All right. Makes sense. All right. Yeah, someone in chat says, you know, I've heard this a couple of times, like, the matchup seems favorable unless it's against a specialist. Uh, that's often the case for, for D&T, where, like, if, yeah. you, if you have decent matchup knowledge, a, a ton of matchups are relatively favorable. It's just... When you're playing against someone who doesn't let you eke out all the small edges that you're normally used to, things get significantly harder. It's true. It's very true. Like, I played against a lands player that I didn't know the name of, and I crushed him 2-0. And then I played against Jody Keith, and it was like 70 times harder, so. Alright, so next up we have El... Oh, sorry. Eldrazi Post. I started looking at the wrong line there. Alright, so you went negative mom... Negative Jitte, negative a Stoneforge, cut a Crusader, bring in the own Relic Order, Path, Cataclysm, Council's Judgment. All right, so the ends definitely seem fine. Hey, Connor. Connor. Uh, give me one second, Phil. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Hold on. Yeah. Um, I'm in kind of a phone call thing. Can you guys come back? Or... 
already impressed. I, I have about like five more units here. Okay, yeah. Can you take the Uh, Yeah, I can try to remember. <laughs> Should be about an hour. Okay, I'll be your brother. Just an hour and a half. Thanks. Yeah, um, Akaleth. Revoker can definitely steal a lot of games versus lands very easily, just because, like, there are so many of those, like, hands that don't actually have true green mana. So I can totally understand keeping those and wanting to, like, mize game twos and threes. Lands, a lot of times, is a matchup where you look for an opening, and you go and you try to find an opening, and you will just, like, win the game immediately. So there's a lot of times where you're, like, trying to set up, yeah, you're jockeying for position, and you're just trying to find this moment where it's like, okay, I can go and trigger out the Maze of it this turn and get right. an absurd amount of damage. Sorry about that. I'm back. Oh, no problem. Okay, uh, so we were just talking about Eldrazi Post, right? Yeah. Yeah, so these seven are e are easy ins. Um, yeah, Mom's bad, Jitte's not great, and then you just need to trim some other stuff. Um, yeah, this this seems fine to me. Sanctum Prelate's a little yeah. bit awkward, but like sometimes the safety net of being able to put that on seven or eight is very nice. Those, that's good, but also I found if you're in the early game, like sometimes if you're on the play, you can hit like two for Grim Monolith. Yeah, and, and that does shut off some random stuff too, like the Warping Whales that they yeah. can play. Yep, so this, yeah. this seems fine. I thought Thalia to be better too here because it, you know... Yeah, they, Thalia they, they is more... a real card versus this deck, whereas it's not really versus Eldrazi. Yeah, they run more non-creature stuff early, so... All right, so now against like here's another stone blade. Yeah, here's another matchup where I have no idea what I'm doing, literally. So just scrap what I have and tell me what to do. I don't think <laughs> I right. have is correct at all. Well, let's let's start with what you have just to have a, a talking point because it might be sort of revealing to me for how you go and approach it. Well, I can already tell you cataclysm's wrong. I'm not sure what I'm doing there. <laughs> uh, cataclysm so, is, is debatable. It, Okay. That's it's not like necessarily wrong. I see a lot of people play it in this matchup. Okay. It just seems pretty bad when you're cataclysming a true name in a batter skull, but uh yeah, that's that's the problem. Okay, so this was your initial thoughts. Yeah. So um why are you bringing in ballista? What's what's that doing? Uh I was thinking of it as a, a way to deal with like Planeswalkers, okay. but that might be loose. So, like, just ping, ping off it the also chase. Hits, yeah, it also hits, like, Snapcaster and Vendillion Click. Okay. That's that's not unreasonable. Um, so, why are you playing Path to Exile? I don't know. Am I? I don't think I am. Oh. I didn't bring it in. Never mind. That was something else from before. Okay, so let me just double check yeah. this. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, I should you can bring in the third chalice. I do like chalice in the chalices matchup, were something you were looking at. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's so nine cards, I believe. Two cataclysm, two judgment, ballista, relic order, three yeah. chalice. Okay. So this is something I've been doing for years. But I actually usually end up boarding out all of my spot removal versus blade decks. Okay. So you don't lose the game to a Stoneforge Mystic for a Jitting, right? You lose the game to a like true name that gets a hold of that Jitte. So Yeah, then you're just dead. A lot of times the, the problem card is not the equipment, it's actually just like the true name or the in in most cases. Yeah. So like, for example, your your first strikers or your moms can just go and beat out a just, like, cold piece of equipment from your opponent. So... Um, on a side note, how do you feel about Holy Light? 
Holy Light is an extremely narrow but powerful card. I think it's usually wrong to go and play that card. And I think a lot of times it's someone who's gotten, like, burned one too many times by, like, True Name Nemesis or Elves. But yeah. it is one of the few cards that we we can play that's reasonable that answers a True Name while having application elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. So I haven't played this matchup very much post-Chalice, but I imagine Chalice is fine. So normally... I, I tend to keep... I think Chalice is really good. Like, if you're cutting swords already, uh, they actually run a lot of one-drops. If you look at oh, their yeah, lists, like, like... You know, so probably much between of that deck 8 and like 12 cantrips. cantrips, plus 4 mana, four one-mana removal spells, maybe another one or two yeah. post-sideboard. Yeah, so yeah. while normally I keep, like, Moms in in this matchup, like, if we're going to bring Chalice in, it might make sense to cut those. I also don't really love Crusader, um, which either. I agree with you there. I also don't love Palace Jailer, because they're a true name deck. Yeah. So, this is a time where, like, either we keep in Mirror and Crusader and we accept that it's awkward versus true name nemesis, so we have nine for nine. Or how do you feel about keeping in two mom? Yeah, that was the other thing. One of the things I like about mom in this matchup is that there are situations where you have like a board stall and they've got a true name and you have like some dude with some equipment and you need a way to get through it. Um, Like I get that you have sword, but I think like mom is a decent recruiter target just to like be able to get damage through. Yeah. That was the other thing I was going to say. The other thing is that like mom plus um, plus another piece of, Sorry, another creature, a lot of times it's great. Or even just protecting your own stuff if you don't have a chalice. Yeah. I, I would probably be inclined so like, to I do like this. Cutting, I like cutting two mom, yeah. Yeah, but right. like keeping the jailer in the deck is so dangerous against any true name deck, especially a true name control deck. Yeah, that's true. It's funny because I still board in Marchessa against uh, blade decks, but like when I'm playing Loam. Well, but you're but you're the control I, deck there, right? So yeah, I am. I and mean, I also think I like doing that because it has haste, and so it's more relevant against Jace than Jailer is. It's funny looking at the two cards side by side because they both have like their pluses. Like Jailer takes a creature off the board, but Mom gives you haste and death touch dudes. So, or by I mean Marchessa. All right. Uh, so we have Red Prison next. Yeah, I know this is one of the best matchups for DNT, but I'm two and one against it. They can still get you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like sometimes you'll just lose to some like rabble master starts. That just it is what it is. Yeah. Right. Or like when they have uh, they're absurd. Like like you don't have an answer to fiery confluence early, and they just like keep confluencing you. It's pretty bad. Uh, however. Similar to how Teague is very good when you play Loam, Prelate is absurd. All right, so you're bringing in Relic Order, Cataclysm, Council Judgment, Ballista. Oh, sorry. Council Judgment, Relic Order, Cataclysm, Ballista. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So did, uh, did I, and I don't count wrong I here? No, this, this was just no, from a different column. Fine. Yeah, I don't know what I'm supposed to board out. I assume Crusader's terrible. Yeah, Cru- Crusader's pretty bad. So... Uh, you're definitely boarding in the right cards, and then what you need to decide next is which which one drops do I want to trim? Because, like, they're going to keep Chalice in. It's not a great card, but it is definitely the sort of card where, like, it can enable <laughs> some of their draws to just take over the game. Yeah, um, so here's my, my weird thing about this matchup. I... I don't know how many swords I want to take out because sulfur elemental is a huge problem. Yeah, so some of it depends on like what build your opponent is playing. In a vacuum, uh, a lot of times in my builds, I go like, cut the swords to plowshares, cut the moms, cut a crusader, and like, I'm good to go. And in your build, like you only have six cards to bring in. Yeah. So, and you have a second Mirror Crusader to take out. 
Um, which one of these would I want to do? How good is mom? Is there any merit to just cutting all four moms? Yeah, there, there certainly is. So mom can help protect some of your lock pieces. And like, yeah. it can save a more important card from like a fiery confluence. It, it might just be correct to do something like a 3-1 split where you leave yourself a mom as a tutor target in case that matters. Eh. I think that's fine. I don't I like know. That. The, just cutting the moms... Mm. The, the issue is that now with a lot of the builds going and like picking up the Goblin Rabble Master and Legion Warboss tech together, that having yeah. more sorts of five shares matters more than it used to. But at yep. the same time, like, Mom and Thalia is gross. Yeah, I mean, I understand that Chalice is fine against your swords, but, like, you still have ways to get the Chalice off the table, like Flicker Wisp, Relic Order. Like, it's not impossible to remove it with the stick. Yeah, so your, your correct answer is, like, cut four of Mom and swords. And honestly, it might depend on what you see of your opponent's build. So, for yeah. example, if I see that they are, like, relatively creature light in game one, I might board out all of my swords and, like, play moms for, for game two. And, you know, if I yeah. see sulfur elementals, then I might, I might swap. So, like, you know, the, these are your weak cards. But, like, for example, if your opponent is playing pyroclasms as their sideboard hate, then, like, Mom is great. If they're playing Soul for Elemental, Swords is clearly better. Right. Makes sense. Yeah, this is probably slightly frustrating because a lot of times I'm telling you, like, well, it really depends, is, is your answer. No, that's fine. I get it. Um, I think the matchup's obviously very good in general anyway, so I'm not sure it would matter too much. Uh, I mean, I know they have draws that can beat you, but they die to a lot of what you're doing. Yeah. Um... um I've noticed that, like, Prelate on 4 is usually game over. Correct. So, And and that's one of the, like, great things, is, like, if you do a Prelate on 4 backed up by Mom, it's it's just insane. Yeah. That's kind of why I like taking out two of each. Because I think they're both useful in different situations. Yeah, it's and, just and that's hard totally reasonable. Sometimes your opponent will just go, like, Warboss, Warboss, Rabble Master, and you have two Moms, and you're like, F. And then other times... You know, they blow up your prelate, and you're like, wish I had a mom, you know, so I just hope you have the right cards in the right situation. All right, um, so I've probably got another 25 minutes that I can do this for, so we're probably not going to plow through all of these, so... Yeah, that's fine. I actually, right after the next five, it gets into some pretty, like, obscure tier X matchups, so if we can get through... Why don't we go through... Dredge, Elves... Burn, sneak, and loam. That'd be good. All right, that that'll be perfect. Yeah, yeah. I've, I'm I'm sure you do too, but I've got New Year's Eve plans that I'm gonna have to start preparing for. Yep. No, I'm in the same boat. I don't have too much time left either. But these are the last five matchups I care about. The other matchups are pretty like tier four, so I don't see them that often. Yeah. Plus, like after you know two hours or so of just talking through some matchups, I think you'll have a better idea of you know like. Is, oh, yeah, is this, this really a Chalice helpful. matchup? Is this really a Cataclysm matchup? Yeah, I really appreciate uh, the help so far. I feel like I understand a lot more than I did, so that's good. All right, so we've got Dredge. Yeah. I don't have Macabre anymore. I'm assuming you just bring in third Chalice. Yeah. Chalice is awkward versus Dredge, where like it's clearly good yeah. enough to play... But once they have the treasures in the graveyard, it's like, well, this does nothing. Yeah, I mean, it's good enough that you want to shut off, like, you can shut off LED on the play. I think that's good. Oh, yeah. But it's not, like, the best card ever. It's just awkward because, like, once they have the Cabal therapies in the graveyard, you're not actually countering the part that you care about. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right. We're going minus Wisp Jailer, Stoneforges, Equipment, A Mom, 
you're adding in a priest, a relic hoarder, a fairy that we don't have, the surgicals, the rest in peace, the chalices, and the paths. Yeah. All right. I'm going to tell you, you missed something. You missed something super cute. Oh, what did I miss? Walking Ballista. You cast it for X equals zero to kill their bridge from belows. Ah, indeed. <laughs> that actually seems pretty good. Uh, yeah. So, like, Walking bridge Ballista is, the main way. is like, on their like graveyard. Way you lose. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Oh, I was just saying, it seems like Bridge is the main way you lose this matchup. Yeah, that's that's correct. You you care about very little of their deck other than Bridge from below. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, one of, the, one of the questions you, you're going to have to ask is, like, how much of my equipment package do I want to keep? And your your answer right now is, I don't want to play any of it. Yeah. But here's the thing. When they just poop some zombies, the ability to gain life to stabilize is very important. And there's actually a huge percentage of the time where you use Jitte to kill your own creatures to get rid of bridge from below. Okay. So we actually might want to keep some amount of this package in. So I'm just going to resort this and let's kind of think through things from scratch. Yeah, no, please do. Please so, correct my... Like, obviously, Palace Jailer, not really where you want to be against a deck that's going to go wide. Nope. Sanctum Prelate might not be fast enough. Like, do you... Probably not. Do you want to, like, try to put that on one? That, that only I really... <laughs> I don't think it's good, you're right. Yeah, it's way too late. You can, at least Chalice you can play on turn zero. Yeah, so like, this is, this is awkward. Like, it can do things. Like, you can put on four to stop a Dread Return. Like, that can be fine, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree with taking it out. A lot of times you'll just end up losing to, like, Cabal Therapy stuff anyway. Like, yeah. just Cabal Therapy make a bunch of zombies. Yeah. So... We're gonna want to trim, probably sort of fire and ice. Like that's that's yep. a lot of times not gonna get through. And like a couple flicker wisps probably find the trim. They don't really have too many good targets that we can muck with. Yep. So relic order probably doesn't need to come in. Okay. Like that's. Like, I understand there's this world where you, like, use it and try to hit an LED. But yeah. then they just, like, discard their hand in response, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know that this is going to work out in the, like, magical Christmas land getcha gotcha scenario that you want all that often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, these ten cards are fine. We may not end up boarding in every single chalice. And we also might only play all three when we're on the play. Right. Because on the draw, like, they can just play out LED, they can play their first one drop, and this loses a lot of its power. So this is... Yeah, so maybe you don't even bring in any chalices on the draw. Yeah, so let, let's kind of put this over to the side. So, like, assuming we're playing seven for sure... Yeah. We'll want to pull some other stuff. Um... You, you trimmed a couple of moms before. That's probably fine. Mom's, mom's not stellar. It, yeah. it occasionally can protect against some weird sideboard removal that you, they might have for something like a containment priest. But it's certainly yeah. medium. So that's seven, two mom, two wisp, and then the other three. So for the chalice on the play... So something like this is probably correct when you're on the draw. If you're on the play and you want to play chalices then, like, you could pull all your moms and then pull one more creature or, like, pull one Stoneforge or something. Yep. Like, Stoneforge Mystic is not really a card you want to be casting in the early game. And, and this is something you right. can consider trimming otherwise as well. Like, if you don't want to trim a mom, 
you can trim a stone forge instead. Okay, makes sense. All right, so elves. On the elves, your favorite. Uh, yeah, it's it's brutal. <laughs> when I got when I got paired or when I got invited to the Legacy Premier League, um, I submitted a deck list, and my thought was like. I'm just going to completely ignore the fact that Julian is in this tournament. I'm not going to, like, board any special cards for him. Like, if I get paired against him, so be it. I accept the loss. And sure enough, I get paired yeah. against him in my first round. <laughs> That's magic for you. All right. So you went Thalia's out, a Wisp out, two Moms out, and Jailer out. Yep. And so in you went... Path, Council Judgment, two Chalice, which will now probably be three Chalice, Priest and Ballista. All right, uh, so why are you ringing Council's Judgment? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't. Uh, you probably uh, don't. I don't know what I was thinking. So yeah, I, I guess I guess I was thinking in my head like, oh, they have Nissa. I, I don't know. So I knew I I came up with this guide like my first few days. Yeah. So Council's Judgment is really only good if they go like natural order for Progenitus and pass. But <laughs> yeah, the only time yeah. that they go natural order Progenitus pass is when they can't kill you otherwise. Yeah. And so I don't ever board in Council's Judgment for those sorts of scenarios. Um, like, yes, they can happen sometimes, but there's so many times where your opponent can just, like, wait one turn and then actually kill you just as quickly by just not putting out yep. the Progenitus and exposing it to a Council's Judgment. Right. Um, I haven't played this matchup a lot post-playing Chalice of the Void, so, like, there's definitely some tension between these one-drop removal spells and the chalices. Yeah. So. I think it's good enough, though. Like, chalice on one's pretty big oh, beating. 100%. Like, the chalices are coming in. Like, the question is, like, yeah. are these Path to Exiles good enough? Because you really only want to point them at Wirewood Symbiote in most cases. Right. The answer's probably yes. Like, yeah. mo most of these main deck cards suck. That's just kind of the nature of the matchup. <laughs> uh, you definitely want Thalia's out. You definitely yeah, want like Jailer out. These these five are easy. Moms are medium. Flicker Wisp is medium. Yeah. Um, if we if we've got seven, I'd probably keep another mom. Okay. Like, Wisp is not great, but it's a flyer. Flyers can carry Jitte. Like, similarly, Sword of Fire and Ice <laughs> yeah. is not amazing, but if your Jitte gets blown up, it's a way to kill creatures. Yeah. This is this is one of those ones where you just, like, you board what cards you have and you pray. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the sneak first low matchup. You just hope that they have a bad hand. This is kind of one of those matchups where, like, I'm willing to mull into Oblivion. Like, I don't accept mediocre. Like, I need good. Yeah, yeah, you probably want... <laughs> something that does stuff early. Yeah. The way I won the only Elves matchup I played was definitely through, like, I had, like, Vile, and I had an early Revoker, and then I was able to get enough pressure to kill him because they couldn't activate Heritage Druid for long enough. That was pretty much how I won. All right, so next up we have Burn. You went Jail, yeah. Revoker, Crusaders out for... Relic Quarter, Council's Judgment, Chalice, and... And uh, now you want a third Chalice, so be another card you'll have to find a board out. Uh, okay, so one thing about this matchup is, like, you kind of have to decide how you want to play it, because yeah. you can hedge against your opponent having more creatures by boarding in Path to Exile as well. Yeah. But it's it's awkward alongside Chalice. Yeah, I think Chalice is really, really good in the matchup, especially if you can get to the point where you can put it on, like, two, because it stops their ways to get rid of, like, Batter Skull and Jitte. 
Um, well, putting it on two is super I'll... awkward because like your deck is full of like Stoneforge's Thalia, Sarah Avengers. Like yeah, that's true. Sanctum Prelate on You're two right. is much better than yeah, uh, yeah. Like Chalice on two. I think Chalice on one, Prelate on two is probably game over. Uh, that's real hard to beat. They basically have to use like exquisite firecraft, um, yeah, fire blast, and uh, sulfuric vortex to beat you at that point. I found this matchup to be a lot easier than it is with Loam because you have Batter Skull, which is like they just concede to Batter Skull if you can attack with it ever. So yeah, so this also might be a matchup where like play draw you do something different. So, for example, yeah. Chalice loses a little bit of the punch when you're on the draw. So, right. So, for for example, if you're on the draw, you could do something like 5 for 5 and play extra answers to creatures, whereas when you're on the play, you know, you might do something like this and then trim one other creature in order to yeah. support in these six. What's the one creature you're trimming on the play? That's like, because, you know, Crusader's bad, Revoker's bad, Jailer's bad. It's probably a Recruiter. Okay. Like, Re Recruiter is slow, but it's just another copy of Stoneforge Mystic or Sanctum Prelate. So, yeah. Recruiter's great on your vile hands and pretty bad on your non-vile hands. Um, uh, of note, if your opponent's playing Grim Lava Mancers out of the sideboard or even in the main deck, then you probably keep provokers in and like trim another yep. recruiter. Yep. Uh, you try not to trim Flicker Wisp in this matchup because of the specific card Sulfuric Vortex. So at their end step, you can blink it out so you can gain some life on your turn with like a Batter Skull connection. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, the next matchup is the bane of my existence. Sneak and show. I hate I hate this deck, Phil. I, re I just... I'm going to do an hour stream someday where I talk about only how much I hate this deck. Uh, and how much I wish they would ban Omniscience forever. And do a deep, dark cellar, never to come out again. That, that card, card is real obnoxious. It just... It doesn't take any skill, Phil. It's like, oh look, I had a soul land and an island... And I had this enchantment and an Emrakul. I win the game. Like, good for you. Like, I, I mean, I could teach a five-year-old to do the same thing. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I hate it so much. I, I get so salty when I play against that deck, and I have to work on just, like, saying nothing. <sighs> All my decks lose to it. All the things I love doing in Legacy just lose so hard to that card alone. Oh, Arkin, I don't know how recently uh, you host me, but thank you very much for your support. For anyone who tuned in, hello, my name is Phil Gallagher. I run Raven University, a site for legacy death and taxes. And today I'm doing a tutoring session. So we're talking about sideboarding with legacy D&T right now. And we're talking about worst deck ever. Sneak and show, in case that wasn't <laughs> <Yeah>. clear. <laughs> God, I, I just don't have enough words in the English language. And you know the worst part is I've played against this deck more than any other with Loam. This is the number one deck I've played. I have 49 matches and my win percentage is sub 35% and I'm just like why? Why does everyone insist on playing this on Magic Online? Anyway, uh, what do I do? How do I? Is there a way I win? Because I'm 1-4 in four with D&T so far. Um, no, that's, that's probably about right. Um, on their non-omniscient hands you will usually win. On their omniscience True. hands, you will usually lose. Yeah, and that's the point I try to tell people when everyone's like, can we bring in seven cards for Sneak and Show? And I'm like, no, do any of them beat Omniscience? Don't bother. Because you're already winning if they don't play Omniscience. So. Okay, so the, there's sort of an awkward thing about this matchup, and it's that some of your one-drops are fine in this matchup, but because you're bringing in Chalice, especially three Chalices now, they lose a lot of their, yeah. their punch. So, for example, yeah. normally I leave I leave in some number of moms in this matchup, but we're probably going to end up trimming all of ours here. Yeah. Um, similarly, I don't know if we're actually going to bring in Path to Exile. So, it's an answer to 
what's it called, Arcane Artisan, as well as somewhat of an answer to Grizzlebrand, awkwardly. <laughs> yeah. So they're still probably just winning when they've drawn fourteen cards. Yeah. But, you know. This this is in the maybe pile right now. Uh, yeah. Why do you want surgical extractions? Uh, because when they intuition for show and tell, you get to fuck them. Yes. So, you only <laughs> and play this... And it's a this... great feeling, Phil, okay? Oh it's god, it really feeling. is. <laughs> you only play this if you see that, like, they are mono blue, or if you see the intuition in game one. Like, yeah. otherwise, like, don't bring this in. Okay. So, like, I'm gonna set these off to the side as, like, a card that we're maybe going to bring in. Uh, but, like, generically, this is not a good card. The other issue is that even if they are playing Intuition, like, you really want to Chalice on one in this matchup. Because yeah, that's true. Because then it makes it so they only have a few cards that matter, mostly just show and tell. Yeah. All right. So, if we don't bring in the paths, then we actually don't Keep have... The equipment all that many like we want all of these to come out they're they're not stellar so the moms and swords yeah yeah and like jitte is not great either so even though there's some tension no. there we might end up like boarding in the two paths just to have another answer to arcane artisan while yeah. Like trying that to would make be nine for nine work. if you don't board in surgical yeah and i guess if you're boarding in surgical you can cut the two stone forges or whatever. Some other creature, I don't know. Yeah, it, it also might make sense, like, if you're boarding in the surgicals, maybe you don't play the paths or something. Like, you, yeah. you don't want to have too many cards where, like, the chalice and the cards you want to cast overlap. Right. So. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you do get those games where you get to go... Like, you have more game with this deck than you do with Loam, because you get to go, like, Revoker on Sneak Attack, Call it on 3, and you lock them, and that's nice. Um, yeah, it's, but... it's nice until they cast Kozilek's Return, and you just question why you were ever born. <laughs> All right, side story, chat. Yeah. Here, here's the story of one of the games that I had, like, no idea how I could possibly lose. Um, this was... A week or two after Kozilek's Return was printed, by the way. So this was not a common card yet. So I was... I want to say it was like an, an event in like Philly. It might have been like an Eternal Weekend or something like that. or I, I forget exactly. But I was playing and I have like... Double Mother of Runes, like Thalia, Revoker... Um... I think I was playing, like, Vren Wingmare, too. And I had a Mishra's Factory. And so, like, I have a lethal attack. So I go animate the... Or no, sorry, it wasn't Vren Wingmare. It was, it was Spirit of the Labyrinth. So I go, and I, I animate my, my Manland, and I swing in with, like, Thalia, the, the Spirit, and this Manland. And then my opponent casts Kozilek's Return. And so, like, I lose, my I think, my second land. Like, I was really land light. And I just lose my entire board... And I'm left with, like, a planes. My opponent has nothing, but it doesn't matter because I do. I just dirtle for the rest of the game and die. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It, it must not have been, like, Prolet on 3. It must. It, it was, like, Sanctum. Uh, sorry, did I say uh, Spirit of Labyrinth is what I meant. Spirit of Labyrinth. Yeah, it was, it was brutal. Like, I thought I was insulated from, like, Pyroclasm. It was, it was bad. Yeah, that's how that's how they they do it. They just get you when you think you have it locked up. They'll just like do some dumb some or other cunning wish something and to kill you. Yeah, it gets um, really old. The matchup definitely feels better if you're playing like um, Palace Jailer and Leon and Relic Order because like you have some chance of winning the the guessing game of when they put something in. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just still so bad. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's ever a chance they ban omniscience? I doubt it because it's stupid. Nah. Damn it. Like, it, I mean, the deck gets so much more reasonable without it. Like, I'm fine with you having to, like, play your three mana or four mana way to get in your fatty. And then, like, if I can deal with it, I get more turns. But, like, it's when they get this enchantment into play that says, I win the game, fuck you, that it's like, well, okay. 
why did I bother? Yeah. The, the thing is that, like, even though Show and Tell has been one of the better decks off and on for the past few years, like, there's so many decks that are just, like, actively good against it. It just happens that, like, we're on the wrong side of the interaction spectrum here. Yeah, so the good news about Show and Tell that for decks that I play, like Death of Taxes and Loam, is that inevitably every time Show and Tell has a run at being, like, a Tier 1 deck, one of the best decks in Legacy, that brings back, like, Delver decks and Shadow, which is great for us, so... Yeah, exactly. It's a cycle where we, we end up being really good in the meta at that time. And I think we're there. We're, like, right at that point where people are playing Delver more again, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to just, like, not queuing into only Grixis Control and Miracles every league I play. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. They definitely, I think people have figured out ways to beat it. Like Eldrazi Post is seeing play because of that reason. So that's nice. Anyway, last one, then I'll let you go. All right. So we're doing four color loam now. So yeah. Doing... It's, it's always interesting. I'm 3 0 against it. Uh, I think it's because I know how to play the matchup easily, just because it's like the deck I play. Um, All right. So I, I think I'm okay with my board plan um two judgment cat two cladicism two surgical one rip one ballista i know your feelings on surgical in this matchup i gotta disagree with you that's fine i think as like on the other side of the table hitting punishing fire is huge hitting life from the loam is pretty huge even hitting like knight of the reliquary if they like loam it into their graveyard is also huge um hold on i think i think i missed something oh uh we no longer have fairy to bring in no, don't have fairy anymore. So, uh, I've had death and taxes players leave in Thalia against me as a lone player, and I, I don't get it. That's probably a mistake. I think that card is terrible. Um, so bring that out. Yeah. Uh, so if we're gonna keep one more of these, uh, probably keep the fourth mom on the play. I, I think, think mom's so. very good on the play. I agree. Like as a lone player. When my Death and Taxes <clears throat> opponent goes turn one mom pass, if I don't have an answer, the game gets much, much harder for me to win. Yeah, so. but when you're on the draw and they can just Punishing Fire the mom you play turn one, it's so much worse. Yeah, so I think I like bringing out the four moms on the draw and keeping in Wisp, Jitte, and, Sto and a Stoneforge. Wisp, Jitte, Stoneforge. Yeah, and or then I, the I play... guess you have to keep the second stone, the other, the fourth Stoneforge as well, because we have eight here now. Right, two, four, six, seven, eight. Yeah, you're right. So you're just um, boarding it, boarding out four moms and four Thalias on the draw, and you keep in the yeah, moms that, on the that play. Yeah, that seems fine to me. Yeah, um, just because. No, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just just as a side note, I think that this matchup is very difficult to sideboard for because you have to decide the angle of attack that you want to attack from. So, like for example. I see some people that do keep their Thalias and they decide, like, I want to try to tax my opponent off of casting their Haymaker spells. And that is an approach, and it, it works fine sometimes, but I, I feel like your chances of winning just go down a lot when that plan goes wrong. And let me say, I don't think Cataclysm is very good against Loam, because you get you have Mox Diamond, you have land, like plenty of land, you have Life in the Loam. However... Um, as a Death and Taxes player on that side of the table, the way that I beat Death and Taxes with Loam most of the time is Planeswalkers, and I think Death and Taxes has a very hard time beating cards like Braska and Ajani, uh, and Cataclysm is a way to just get them off the table, and that's that's the reason I play them. It's just more answers to stuff that Loam tries to do post-board. Yeah, so I, I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is how different the like, pre- and post-board games against that deck are. Because in game one, you're really focused on the creatures, where you know, you're, right. you know you're you're zeroing in on the dark confidants and knight of the reliquaries that are beating you. Whereas in the post cyborg games, it's like, oh god, there's a Johnny Benjamin, and now Garouk's coming in. Oh no, there's a Liliana last hope. Oh god, Golgari yeah. charm. So yeah. like the the just nature of the matchup yeah. changes a lot. In the grindy matchups, Loam becomes the control deck, and it's this like big planeswalker deck, and that's like super difficult for DNT to beat because the planes and walkers are all so good at what you're trying to do. And so Cataclysm at least like helps you get them off the board. I mean, if you can Cataclysm a lone player when you're at, when you at least have like, like if you have like a Sarah Avenger plus a sword, then you probably just win that game. So 
regardless of if they get to keep their Mox Diamond or whatever. Um, I also know, like, revokering a Mox Diamond or Flicker Wisping a Mox Diamond is very good. I think Death and Taxes players should do that more in the matchup because as a lone player, if I have a Mox Diamond hand, I'm generally pretty reliant on that Mox Diamond. So, yeah, to just like get rid of them, make a comparison. Lands, traditional lands is, is basically a two color deck and they, they ca care about having red and green, right? But yeah. Loam is a four color deck. And like, if you look at the things you're trying to cast in the first couple of turns, like, you know, in the matchup, you have things like Golgari Charm, Punishing Fire, Lily Last Hope. Like, there's, there's a lot of different mana costs there, and sometimes just taking them off of one of those colors, or, you know, just, you know, essentially using a Flicker Wisp as, like, another Wasteland, those, those things can be huge. And, like, yeah, and I played so against much tempo. I played against Loam the other day, and I beat it 2-0, and the main reason, he had, like, a hand, a double Mox Diamond hand, and so I just, I had, um, like... I revokered the Mox Diamond, and then I, like, flicker with one, and I just kept him to where he had, like, Caracas, Grove, and Wasteland, and he couldn't do anything. So that's, like, such a key card in the matchup that you really want to be focusing on taking them off the board early if you can. And I think if you can at that point, then Death and Taxes gets a huge advantage. Um, also, having Vile is huge. It's very hard for Loam to deal with Vile. Um, I sometimes think you should mulligan to Vile Hands because the match, the games where you don't have Vile are so much harder to win. <laughs> so, like, because the matchup is, is, is favorable for Loam in general. Yeah. Uh, it's very skill intensive, too. And yeah. when, like, you don't necessarily know what you're doing and how to approach the matchup, I think it compounds the problem a lot. Like, I, yeah, de I definitely. I have gone through tons of different sideboarding plans just trying to like figure out like how, how do I wiggle my, my way through. Like there's definitely other times where like I've even boarded in my own relic order. Like when I was light on cards, it was like, well, maybe this steals a mox for a little while. Yeah. Like, it's I not what you want to be doing. It's not what you want to be doing. Yeah. But like when you're light on yeah. cards for the matchup or like say you didn't want to board in surgical extractions, that like that's an option. Yeah, that's true. And, I mean, there are, it really is very, one of the most, like, player skill dependent matchups that I've played, because, like, as a, on the loam side, I play against the average death and taxes opponent, and I'm almost always winning that matchup 2-0. If I play against a very skilled death and taxes opponent, it gets a lot harder, and I'm, like, 50-50, so. Uh, it really is, like, do you know the matchup well enough? It's a fun one, though. I really enjoy both sides of the table. Agreed. All right. So, uh, but anyway, I'll let you go. Thanks a lot for doing this. It's been very helpful. I appreciate it. Thanks, chat, for coming in and listening and having me on again as a guest. Uh, just a little plug. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, something doesn't change tomorrow. I'll be guesting on XJ Cloud's stream to help him through playing Loam. So, oh, awesome. Just throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Connor, I, I always sort of like do do a little recap at the end. Um, and usually yeah. it's over my results, but just as a, a take home message, you know, what, what do you, what do you feel were like some of your most important takeaways from this little tutoring session here? Just learning, like a lot of what I was struggling with is like, what do I take out in these matchups? Like what are the weak cards? And so figuring out like, where do I want to take out mom? Where do I want to take out flicker wrist? Where do I want to board in chalice? Like understanding, um, exactly like the game plan that I'm trying to have is, was really helpful. So. Definitely appreciate that. Uh, and I also, I think this deck is super fun. I think it's great. I think it's actually relatively well positioned right now, and we're on the cusp of having DNT be tier one again because of the influx of Delver and Shadow. Uh, and it's like right at that point where people aren't necessarily boarding for DNT yet. So I think it's a really well positioned deck again, especially like with Grixis control on the down tick. Uh, but it's definitely a deck I've learned that like really rewards format knowledge and experience. And I can see if you're a new player and you're picking up death and taxes, like you're in for a hard time. So I think it's just like one that rewards a lot of like repetition. All right. Thanks. All right, folks. Yeah. Gonna... Thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. All right, Connor, if you want to go ahead and go, I'm just going to do some uh, closing stuff with the stream here. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, man. All right. Bye. All right.
So I, I hope this all was, was useful to some of you, especially the, the newer D&T players out there. Um, I know it's kind of weird to do a stream and not have any, any gameplay, but I, I hope this was, was helpful to at least some of you. Um, I'm currently sort of figuring out some, uh, some life stuff. Uh, my car got bumped the other day, and I'm going to have to uh, go in and get that fixed. So I think I'm going to lose a lot of time in the next day or two to that. So I might not be able to make my Wednesday night stream happen. Just kind of stay posted on Twitter and Facebook and the usual places for that. I'll, I'll message you all when I know what's going on about that. Um, but otherwise, I've got a handful of exciting things coming up in the next couple of weeks here. So this is kind of the approximate schedule. So this loam stream might end up getting moved somewhere else. I have a couple of things that I didn't have time to go and post here yet, but I have some cool things coming. So number one, uh, I received support from a certain podcast to run this deck chat. So Tainted Pact is, is coming back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's going to happen later this month at some point. I'm super excited for that. Um, Dr. Bill also bought me dinner one time, and so I'm going to do a uh, a D and T stream for him. I was planning on buying him dinner, and he he beat me to it. So uh, there's a D and T stream here and the Tainted Pack stream here that aren't in the, the the sort of queue yet. I'm also going to be receiving a donation of some ticks for the most deck. That is that, uh, like, Green Sun Zenith Fauna Shaman Singleton deck list that featured a whole bunch of really weird cards. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as, as well. So that's what's coming up here in, in the next month. So Happy New Year's to y'all. I hope you all have some great plans for tonight. And, you know, stay safe, be responsible, and all that jazz. You're adults. Maybe you are. I don't know for sure. Either way, stay safe. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and send you over to someone else who is playing some Legacy. And two, two, two plugs before we go. Number one, if you enjoyed my content today, please consider following, you know, subbing to the stream, don doing a donation deck list or something else to support me. Number two, if you are interested in what I did today and you want to have a tutoring session, uh, note they're not usually streamed. This is just something I was doing as sort of a, a plug for my own content and because I thought Connor would enjoy the, the publicity as well. But if you enjoy the, the tutoring thing, I do do that. Uh, my current rate has been dropped from $30 to $25 an hour. And if that's something you're interested in, shoot me an email and we'll talk. Cheers, folks. Have a great rest of the day.